seeing the presence of everyone, um, calling this meeting to order at 632 of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. The first item on our agenda is approval of the minutes of May 8th. If you want to take a look through them, and obviously a motion would be in order whenever someone wants to make it. Yes. I move to accept the minutes of uh, Tuesday, May 8th. Is there a second? been moved and seconded. Are there edits? I realize it's long. Seeing none, all those in, prove, uh, in favor of approving the minutes of May 8th, signify by raising your hand. Uh, is there any nays? Abstentions. One abstention. So it carries, I think we're at present, 701. Uh, the minutes are approved. Um, we're going to move next into announcements and public comments. Um, during the last meeting, which people probably are aware of, um, uh, I ended up reading at the very beginning of the meeting a statement of our policy on uh, the announcement and public comment period and, in which public comments are, are welcome as a reminder of it, and I'm not quoting from it. It's not sitting here in front of me. But the, the general gist of it was, uh, that A, it is not a period in which the school committee uh, is debating with the public. It's something in which we welcome uh, the public's comments, look forward to hearing what you have to say, and we'll either uh, incorporate that feedback in an item during the meeting if it's something on the agenda, and if it's something that's not on the agenda, it'll be uh, considered for a future agenda in which the committee can discuss it uh, in public. Um, the second thing is uh, the the Comments are limited to three minutes. In most meetings in the past, I've been fairly strict about that. Uh, in the last meeting, I made the observation that I wasn't, because there was a lot of people who wanted to speak, I wasn't going to be sort of ruthless about gaveling the three-minute mark. So I'm going to maintain that uh, uh, approach this time. But I will tell you that most people came in around three minutes and 15 seconds or three minutes and 20 or so. So it wasn't anything people were... Uh, it was really a, an opportunity to get people to allow to finish their thoughts as opposed to an open-ended session. So if it goes on too long, obviously, I'll uh, gavel it. Uh, and then the third comment was that for both members of the school committee, um, when we're discussing items, as well as all for the, also for the public, um, if you look at our policy, you'll note that it says that uh, the, our, our discussions or, or deliberations, including the public comment period, uh, is discussing... Uh, the uh, policies and decisions of the uh, school district and not individual um, personnel um, or comments that would go to uh, the character or judgment about those character about those individuals. That's something which uh, is both, I think, an appropriate ethic, ethical policy of the committee, but is also something that for the committee, um, something we take very seriously. So... Uh, well, I'll end up just I just want to forewarn everyone I did this the same thing last time that I'll end up gaveling out those comments and just as a comment since people who were here last time are here uh, I made the same observation last time that there's a peculiarity about the uh, way our policy is written is that there was actually nothing preventing people from uh, appraising the work of administrators or staff or teachers uh, the actual language of the policy has to do with um, disparaging them. So uh, I, 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 as I said last time, although I think there's a common sense to that, I also in a way apologize to the public for that um, se seemingly uneven thing. That's by the way, I think in a perfect world, everyone would be keeping their comments to policy and management as opposed to individuals. Uh, anyways, I want to say that up front just because I want to be able to make sure that uh, whatever facilitation I'm doing uh, is done fairly. And, and further, I guess just as another observation, um, you know, the chair is the servant of the committee. Uh, so uh, although this may seem obvious, uh, and at times since I'm at the center point of the table with a gavel, it may seem like uh, I'm directing a show, but the reality is I only, and of course we're going to have a reorganization next meeting. Um, so this is potentially my last meeting as chair. Um, I, I only exist for the pleasure of and the functionality of the committee itself. The work and decisions we do, we do together and are always made together. The framing of the decision is done something that is a power of the chair, 
um, that I do typically in, in concert with the superintendent's input. Um, but in fact, even there, if you've been following our meetings for the last year, you'll notice that there's a copious amount of time in the back end of the session, usually when we're talking to an empty room, in which the committee actually has a lot of input to what's on the agenda. Um, if I've ever violated that spirit, um, I apologize to the committee and don't wish to do so again. But I'm just saying that even though the comments are directed to the chair, the reality is I'm the servant of the group, not uh, any more of a leader than anyone else here. So with that, um, oh, yes, sir, Mr. Demling. Um, would it be okay if I read the section that I feel is particularly pertinent to the voicing of complaints during public comments? Yeah, I think that'd be great. I, I just didn't happen to have it in front of me. I, that's why I was paraphrasing so it's, it. it's policy B-E-D-H. Yes. It's all available online if anybody wants to go look at it sure. on their phone. It's on the website. Um, so the section is most relevant. Speakers may offer comments and opinions about the school operations and programs that concern them. But in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel, nor against any member of the school community, either by name or by reference to position. Under most circumstances, administrative channels are the proper means for disposition of legitimate complaints involving staff members. So um, it doesn't say it here, but the um, school committee accepts complaints um, of this nature via email, also occasionally in person. Um, but this policy expressly prohibits them in the particular venue of public comment. That's true. That's very true. Hopefully, that, I think I did a reason. You're, that's a wonderful. Glad you read it. I think I did a reasonable job of characterizing yes. it, though. Um, okay. And so, also the other thing I'd point out is that sometimes when we have our public comment period, after it's done, the room empties out. And I realize you're all very busy, and, and it's even uh, wonderful that you heard it, regardless of what you say, regardless of um, what uh, you're saying to potentially critique programs and policies or otherwise. Um, I think it's wonderful you're here and contributing your voice, but I'd also point out that if you look, since I think some of you are probably going to be interested in this topic, uh, if you look at item one after our subcommittee updates, superintendent updates, and chair's report, we do have an item on licensure and hiring uh, process, the middle school principal search, and the search process committee, that process-oriented group that uh, Assistant Superintendent Cunningham described. So I bring that up only because I think there are, in fact, going to be even answers or uh, responses, whether they're directly to an individual or really more importantly, indirectly, you know, addressing the substance of an issue that are going to come up later in the agenda. And so I would actually welcome people staying, that we would all welcome people staying if they like to hear through those uh, sections, if they so wish. Um, so with that, um, announcements and public comments is open. If you have a public comment, please come up to the microphone, uh, identify yourself by name, and as I mentioned before, you have three minutes to speak. I need 10 minutes. Uh, well, uh, we don't have 10 minutes. Um, I guess I have to ask the committee whether they're interested in suspending our rules. This to is do a some. statement from more than one person. Hmm? This is a, a statement of from people that can't be here. I'm still just following my own our, our own rules. Mm -hmm. Mr. Donnelly? My feeling is that our past precedent has been it's it's a generous three minutes, and so you've not gaveled at 301, 310, even four. Ten seems a little excessive. Um, there are many issues that represent many people. And when I spoke I um, two months ago, or the two meetings ago, I was being gaveled and interrupted. And last meeting, no one was interrupted or gaveled. No one went any further than four minutes last time, though. Um, I, t I was timing everyone. like I'm putting the committee on the spot. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, our general rule is, is three minutes, and I, we are generous with that three minutes, I think. Um, and there are other ways, certainly, um, if you have sure. um, I'll use other information ways. to send us. We're, you know, clearly I have needed, not so. been responded to, but sure. Um, sure, we'll do that. Uh, that is also true. Okay. okay. Uh, other people cede their time? Their time? Other, yeah, yeah, yes, they could. Um, they should come up and do that, but please continue, or please if you'd like. Thank you. Excuse me. I am Chrissy Harmon, and I'm here to pick up where I left off two school committee meetings ago, in which I addressed the discrimination of an African American principal during the arms hiring process. It turns out in Amherst, the problem of unlicensed administrators leading our schools is not new. It is systematic 
deep-seated and it's led by white male privilege. I am here to address this pervasive practice of hiring unlicensed individuals to administrative positions in the Amherst Public Schools. Now the only thing I can agree with on the teachers who discredited their own profession in service to repairing another person's ego last school committee meeting was this repeated request for transparency. The request I agree with. Um, you just did it right there. You were just criticizing and, and, and characterizing and disparaging the teachers who came and spoke last time. Right, they said how they didn't believe in licensure. I'm, I'm just saying, it, it, you, were, you were characterizing okay. them as opposed to saying you disagreed with the position on licensure. Okay, so can I continue now? Please. Thanks. <clears throat> it was my choice to block the waiver of the previous principal. I blocked her getting a waiver, a hardship waiver, from DESE. The reason why? Because to get a hardship waiver, a superintendent has to prove to DESE that there is a hiring hardship that has taken place, which there was not. So in to invent this hardship, the superintendent has to create public, had to create public suspicion about a principal of color who was well known in the district, <clears throat> to the point that people who knew he had applied for arms the arms principal position began asking him, what did you do? Have you ever been arrested or something? What is it that we don't know? The superintendent made disparaging remarks to keep Point of order, Mr. people yes. that he unilaterally, I'm, I'm saying things that people want me to say. It's important that people in the community hear so what I have to say. So I would just remind the chair, and I guess the public as well, that the section that I read without interpretation does not yeah. talk about Defamation does not talk about rudeness. Right. It's will not hear personal complaints These about school personnel or against any member of the school community, either by name or by reference to a position. So that would include very polite, very rational, very right. fact based complaints about a teacher or a superintendent or an assistant superintendent. And that's, we have other venues for those complaints. Right. Well, that's, that's I followed true. those other venues and have not received a response. Correct? Mm -hmm. I actually think almost everything we're talking about tonight in item one under licensing hiring process, search process, and principal search is in fact directly responsive to what you've written to us. So I'd actually completely disagree with what so you're again, saying. So again, I, can I no, I'm just, I, I'm not saying we can't hear you. I'm just saying. Right, it's just you, continually I'm, interrupted about. Well, that's, the problem is, I mean, the problem is Mr. Demling's actually correct. That you're, you're the problem is I'm saying things that people don't want to hear. That's Excuse me, problem. point of order, Mr. Yes. Chair. I'm not sure we should be engaging in a debate if this is an I opportunity agree. for well, the, let me the, my statement. So if we can just maintain comments that are factual, that are not aspersions against uh, any person sure. in the committee, and that we're not engaging back and forth, I think maybe we can hear this public comment. Sure, sure, I agree. Thank you. I'm just going to reclaim my time. Sure. <clears throat> the superintendent made these disparaging remarks to keep people that he unilaterally decided were quote unquote not the right fit out of what he perceives to be his establishment. No different than a Starbucks manager who creates suspicion of two African American males in order to justify a call to police to remove them from their establishment because they were not the right fit. As we were all engaging last week to last school committee meeting in a pity party slash goodbye, lamenting over the fact that the laws are so inconvenient <clears throat> that Massachusetts laws should not apply to Amherst, <clears throat> even though they are there to create conditions for equitable hiring and to protect the civil rights of students. I was at home reading through piles of documentation that showed that the specific case that was brought up was just one card in a house of cards of a pervasive practice of hiring unlicensed, unqualified educators to administration positions. This was done in one of two ways. Either having them work and never once reporting their licensure to DESE, or two, applying for hardship waivers by saying that there was only one applicant and then having these individuals work under principals with an initial license. <clears throat> if that's not a system that's set up for discrimination, I don't know what is. I wrote out this list of individuals and sent it to the school committee the day after the last school committee meeting. And again, I reiterated this process reflects cronyism, conflict of interest, 
and is a process that is primed to discriminate against highly qualified administrators from obtaining positions unless one white man decides they are not the right fit for his establishment. I wanted to know, why does it say over and over again that there's only one applicant? This was in many cases not true. It certainly saves a superintendent a hassle of having to discredit candidates over and over. There were individuals in the district who had applied for some of these positions. Now, applying for a hardship waiver for an unlicensed individual to be employed over and over and over as is the case <clears throat> when you have so many highly qualified experienced administrators, some of whom happen to be of color, is like applying for welfare and SNAP over and over and over, repeatedly holding back all your bank statements behind your back that show you actually have a $200,000 a year job. There is no hardship that exists in this district to attract qualified administrators. <clears throat> And by the way, it's just simply a Massachusetts requirement. If anyone wants to argue that, they can drive down to Boston, to DESE, to talk about how special Amherst is and why the law should not apply to them. So 24 hours after this last school committee meeting, and I sent this list to the, to the school committee and administrators, <coughs> <coughs> the next day, the superintendent reappointed these individuals behavior that reflects that I was right in my initial remarks to the school committee back in April that this was a hiring system of cronyism that the superintendent had set up and it was set up to discriminate. Point of order, Mr. Chair? I never had any response from the school committee or the superintendent. <coughs> Sorry, point of order? Except a memorandum. Memor memor Sorry, I gotta take a point of order. It's actually part of Rebels for Civil Order. Point of order? So expressing a complaint about a school personnel by name or reference to position is Strictly prohibited in public comment. I'm talking about I a practice. Mr. Chair, that it's a fine line. This is a practice. Presenting facts that yep. raise concern and characterizing something as a cronyism establishment by a white man. Right. But I think that there is a judgment line that needs to be enforced. Right. I'm talking about a practice. It's very Mr. important. I think to, if you could help the committee, because I'm I actually I'm trying to help you get through your statement. You want me to help you manage no, your no. your bad the bad practice that's existing. I'm not going to like sugarcoat it for you. I know that's what you need. No, no, it's, it's let we'll, me just we'll, finish. We'll just con we'll continue, and then he'll keep complaining, and I'll have to keep gaveling. Mr. So. Chair, would it be yes. possible for us to just get that statement maybe emailed to us? Oh, I think um, I've emailed it before many times. This is for the public. I'm in public comments to speak to the public, the people who are not here, to speak. Single mothers, children of, of low socio socioeconomic backgrounds, children of color, the people who are adversely affected by hiring so many unlicensed administrators. I was going to get to that part. Well, um, with the admonition that was stated a moment ago about referencing individuals, I'm or speaking about a practice. Then, t if you can, try to talk about the practice without referencing the individuals, if, you, if you're able to. Please continue. <coughs> so should I give him a code name? What do you want me to do? Point of order, Mr. Chair? Yes. I don't think that the committee should continue to engage in back and forth discussions even though they're Then don't the interrupt me. I'm, I'm not to trying to get engage in back and forth discussions. <clears throat> so we're at four, we're at four okay. minutes. I mean, I, I've I've stopped it and started it again. I'm sorry. I'm making you all feel very uncomfortable. I'm actually not sorry. The reason that was this was given this documentation signed by the superintendent, which repeatedly state that only one applicant had applied, was to create a hardship. Now the explanation that was given from the administration superintendent's office was that there was an error in the application software. Now Desi wants to know as well, why is this repeated process, this practice, this process that I'm speaking to, not the individual but the practice. So Desi asks, can I have your school spring logs? And the response is that there's an application software filtering error. This was the phrasing. So they're speaking about SchoolSpring, which is the application software that's used to hire qualified licensed candidates. And this is a third-party website that's trafficked by thousands of educators. 
So this bizarre glitch, it miraculously filtered out the exact unlicensed candidates that the superintendent already wanted to hire. So what I'm describing here is systematic institutional racism and what that looks like in 2018, where one white person, one white man is literally and figuratively figure, filtering out who he believes can fit in so, that establishment. So you're, you're now, if you can, I think you talked earlier about you handing it over to someone to complete the state, to continue the statement. Did I just leave my five uh, No, actually. Yes, to stand up? Yeah. I'm Jean Sherlock from Leverett, and I just want to uh, start my statement by saying I've been living in town for 30 years. I have a mixed race family, I've raised many kids, and we have experienced and been harmed by the institutional racism in this town for 30 years. Okay, so. You just say I'm yielding. Oh, okay, I'm Unless yielding. To... No, I don't want to say. Okay. What I just described. <clears throat> is where one white man is literally and figuratively filtering out who he believes fits into this establishment. Some people might say, I don't care how he did it. Well, those are the ones who are benefiting from it. Some people say, well, why is licensure so important? Well, one, it's a law. And two, in the absence of following it, the hiring power falls into the hands of a few white men who get to decide where we all fit into their establishment. I know Amherst sees itself as doing right in the terms of multiculturalism. I mean, I already can picture next week a group of teachers are going to come in with their artifacts and they're going to talk about how, who is this imposter woman who's blown up our spot with their multicultural artifacts. I'm not talking about multicultural lessons. I'm not talking about activities or fairs or buffets. I'm talking not even about teacher licensure. We're talking about administration licensure. <clears throat> and the idea of a superintendent and the building principles of multiculturalism and the hiring of administrators is very questionable. When I said to my African-American educator colleagues, many who are talking to me on the phone, calling me, advising me, we're having conference calls, many of whom are watching this, what would a white male have to gain by putting a few educators of color in the district, none who really have any formal administrative training by an accredited licensure program, and in this capacity of administration to offer services to students, what would they have to gain from an endorse a learn-as-you-go model for administration. This was my question to my African-American educator colleagues. From my white lens, I said, but you know, there are some principles of color. One educator of color said to me, he's also a race analyst, <clears throat> he, get, he began to explain to me what's called convergence theory. It's central in what he said is critical race theory. That white men put people of color where it suits them. And he described to me what this particular hiring practice speaks to. He said in Amherst, yes, there are educators of color, but with no administration experience who were recruited to be in subjugated positions to white administrators. He said this kind of practice actually makes a perfunctory or symbolic effort to achieve multiculturalism and administrative staff by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of racial equality within a workforce, and that it results in what he described as the tokenism which actually helps to maintain the underpinning of structural and institutional racism by keeping educators of color in an encapsulated role as this is a quid pro quo practice of hiring that directly undermines these individuals' social justice lens. The impact as a result <clears throat> is that students of color and children of low SES continue to be overrepresented in, this, in discipline. And this is only what's reported to DESE because we know that not all the discipline is being reported to DESE while keeping out highly qualified educators of color who are licensed and if who working in the full capacity of their experience and their credentials and their education present a perceived threat to a white man. Further evidence of this is that here we had a highly qualified African American principal and a highly qualified Latina principal with multiple licenses and years of on the job experience and he says they aren't the right fit. <clears throat> So you're coming up at the second so you're, you're coming up on four minutes again. Okay. So this is I think at this point we've been here more than ten minutes. I don't know if you can wrap up, please. <clears throat> this speaks to a system to keep out highly qualified educators of color, as they are seen as a perceived threat 
who may operate in the f who when operating in the full force of their credentials, education, experience, and integrity as pertains to social justice. Multiculturalism in the Amherst Public Schools, this educator that I was speaking with said, in this context is a buzzword used by white liberals to imply that there's no power differential in the school system. This is white male paternalistic go governing. Due to the level of deflection that has occurred as I repeatedly have tried to address this in the past month, I reiterate the only and sole focus of this entire dialogue has been on the pattern of appointed administrators, discretionary hiring <clears throat> for two years, and how it sits, how it suits or fits with one man's personal image or agenda. So order. let's talk about the effects on students. Let's I gotta, I gotta, I gotta rule students. that. I gotta rule that out the of order. The data shows I mean, that Latino specific. and African American students have been suspended as a rate of 3.5 times their Europe, European American peers. How is it that 22% of the population speaks for 90% of school suspensions? Latino and African American children with lower socioeconomic backgrounds, such as children of single moms, children with special ed services, children on 504s, are all being overrepresented in school suspensions and disciplines. In discipline. District data, and it's only what is reported, shows that these children who are marginalized, who are economically disadvantaged, and who have a disability are the object of these unqualified principles. Now, I am a single mother of three children. I have been raising my three children by myself for six years in this town, and I don't see any single mothers at these meetings. I know their sons are the ones who are being targeted by unfair harassing discipline of these unqualified administrators, and my son has. When I tell educators and parents of color my stories, they'll say, yeah, and your son is white. <laughs> We deal with it every day. That's what they say. Because who are we to say, to complain, to say these things? We haven't lived here for 25 years. We don't show up to school events in a Subaru. So we need, who is we this need, intruder to we blow up our free, spot? We need for you to wrap this up. <clears throat> I submitted this list of unlicensed and unwavered in individuals to the school committee, and it resulted in the superintendent calling in these in individuals and reappointing them to the positions that they're actually licensed for. Still no mention of this has been made. I am here as a PSA that during 2016, there were three illegally employed administrators at arms. In 2017, one at Wildwood, offering discipline and sped services. So and one at Crocker Farm from 2014 to 2018. Move, move to recess. Has, a second? The public has a right to know yeah, that they can have their special recess. education services so reviewed and any hand. discipline such as suspensions opposed? or expulsion should be overturned and taken off student opposed records. opposed abstention? No abstentions? Recessed. We are all here. So, seeing the presence of a quorum of the committee again, I'll call this meeting back to order. Um, we are still in the announcement and public comment period. As mentioned, um, we've gone over the ground rules a million times, but three minutes. Um, please come, feel free to come forward to the microphone. Obviously, the same rules that would have been described ad nauseum before will are still apply. But we welcome your comments. Please come forward three minutes' time. Please just come on up to the microphone and introduce yourself, please. Me. My name is Brian Scully, and uh, I'm not very good at public speaking, so I'll only take about a minute. This is the only the second time in 65 years I've spoken to a group like this. Um, this discrimination complaint by a search committee member was filed when Dr. Morris did not agree with the two finalists the search committee presented him. Instead, he opted to attempt to continue with the current interim principal who has been doing an excellent job while Dr. Morris extends the search for a new permanent principal. 
I appreciate that Dr. Morris is trying to find the right person to protect and educate our kids. Any form of discrimination is wrong. Everyone should have a fair and equal chance to apply for any job and be considered for that job. And seeking diversity is good because it brings talents and life experiences from all cultures into our school system. But diversity should not be used as some sort of a scorecard. This is not a game. It's real life and it's real lives that are going to be affected by this hiring decision, our children's lives. As a parent of a student who will be entering the middle school in two years, I only want the best teachers and the best administrators for all the kids. I don't care about their ethnicity or their color or religion or anything except their ability to do the job well. If Dr. Morris had wanted to extend the search for a new principal and the finalists happened to have been two middle-aged white men, would this complaint still have been filed? I doubt it. In fact, I am betting that the same people who filed that complaint would be applauding him for not taking the easy road and settling for a principal that is less than our kids deserve. Dr. Morris is trying to make the right decisions, and I trust that he is not racially biased or discriminates against minorities based on his record. And I can't help but notice that in some communities, Dr. Morris himself might be considered a minority. We finally have a school superintendent who is focused on our children and not on politics or public relations. His focus is exactly where it ought to be, on the well-being of our kids. Thank you. Hello, I stand before you, Dr. Trevor Armand Baptiste, not the previous chair, but um, um, two chairs ago. <laughs> I come, um, as always, defined as a public servant. Always, um, I'm proud to contribute my civic responsibility, and I want to applaud um, 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 Cindy, who was up here speaking, um, um, Chrissy, I'm sorry, Chrissy was up here doing the same thing and applaud you, sir, for coming to do the same thing. This is what it's supposed to be. For years, we've had these kind of discussions about what is good for the district and have always come to the conclusion that what's good for the district is when people come together and conclude, deliberate, and debate something. And so the problem, and I, I want to again point out, shouldn't be um, 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 uh, obscured by side debates. I said before um, um, to Dr. Morris, kudos for him taking responsibility. There is no debate about whether or not it should be a person of color or not. The debate is about whether or not Dr. Morris should be responsive to the community. And we've always, I shouldn't say always, I should say in my experience, that has always been a debate about how much autonomy a superintendent has to just do what a superintendent wants willy-nilly without being responsible to you elected officials without being responsible to anybody that comes up here. Now, whether it's discrimination, whether it's any other reason, anybody can come up with a reason why they want their administrator, the superintendent, to be responsive. And I'm not talking about Mike in particular. Anybody can come up with a reason they want the superintendent to respond. I don't think this is a particularly illegitimate reason. And more importantly, when it comes to uh, matters of legality, it is incumbent upon you guys to ensure that despite what a superintendent's intentions are, if they are not legal, you must give them the credence that that deserves. Um, Dr. Morris is not, now I'm talking personally about Dr. Morris, he's not new to um, um, this position, he's not new to this arena. Dr. Morris has been here for years and admittedly and respectfully has decided to take this heat. Let's not cool it off by saying the heat is something other than what it is. The heat is not about whether or not um, um, we should have black people or not black people, or whether or not we should have um, 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 Patty Bodie or not Patty Bodie. And please forgive me, Mr. Dimling, I, I don't mean to, to um, 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 dissuade anybody, and I hope I'm not. The issue is, has always been, and still remains, unfortunately, to what extent a superintendent is willing to bend to, to the people's will. I think, personally, that it's been a long road to get to the point where we can have a cross-section of the community 
get together and say what they want to happen, and that can't be thrown out short shrift. Whatever the fallout of that is, you will start to see, as we've seen in the past, a whole bunch of um, um, side arguments. We should be laser focused on just that point, the superintendent being responsive to what the community needs, and I think that's represented by a search committee and, and the new stuff. Thank you for my time, uh, Chairman. Next, I'll just come on forward. Whoever wants to speak, come on forward. I'm not going to call on people. I just please again remind, identify yourself. You have three minutes, up to three minutes, I should say. Uh, my name is Sandra Johnson Anderson. I'm a member of the community. And I just wanted to uh, not necessarily speak to this particular issue that was raised this evening, but just to the issue of the great discomfort I felt uh, sitting where I was and having. Um, a member of the community uh, interrupted in the way that she was, and I believe that it was a little uh, hostile and aggressive, and I'm concerned about that because we have been struggling for years in this district to have these open conversations about our perceived um, interpretation of how the district handles itself um, for the benefit of all of our students. Now, as a person of color, I can tell you, um, in standing in my skin and from my particular perspective, that um, there has been uh, several instances of uh, inequity and unfairness, silencing that has happened in this district. And I would like to call our attention to that, that we be a little bit more open to hearing uh, the views of others, even when those views conflict with our own. And that we be a little bit more respectful of the voices of people. It is not easy to stand before you. It is not easy as a community member to face uh, ostracism and hostility from other community members who disagree with your point. But I would, I would ask that the, 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 the committee, as you have been elected to serve, that you do that, that you listen respectfully, that you hear the voices of the people who are disproportionately affected by policies, wittingly or unwittingly, that, that, that are negative for certain, for certain sectors of our community. And I would, I would implore us, please, to be um, more open, and I wouldn't even say tolerant because uh, tolerance suggests that some people have power and others don't and that you tolerate. I am saying that if we are all saying that we have a voice in this community, that we act it and that we allow those who are, uh, whose views may differ from our own, that they get an opportunity to say what it is that they want said and that those complaints, that those concerns that are voiced that we feel that you hear us and that you have the will to actually do something about those issues that are of concern. So I'm imploring you all again and charging you as a member of the public. President Obama said the greatest responsibility that we could have in a community is that of citizen. And as a citizen of this town, I am imploring those who have been elected to serve all of us so please give a vo give give an ear, give an ear to the to the issues of salience that come up for people of color, for people who are poorer, for people who feel they don't have a voice, for people who are too nervous to come and stand before you. Please hear them, please hear them. Thank you very much. Welcome other public comments if you have them. Again, just come to the microphone, identify yourself and speak. Good evening. Uh, my name is Irene LaRoche and uh, I'm a social studies curriculum leader at Amherst Middle School. I've been at Amherst Middle School since 2003. Um, you've heard tonight that the district has um, had struggles. Um, I believe these are struggles that are worth continuing and I believe that they are struggles towards a positive end. In the last 30 years, we've made groundbreaking commitments and found ways to be ahead of the curve 
in becoming a multicultural school district and working towards social justice. It's imperfect, but we are progressing. And I want to commit that um, to the record. The reason why our district has stood differently in Western Massachusetts is because the school committee, the administration, and teachers and families work together for the goals that they set. Amherst educators are more than teachers. They're part of a group of leaders in the field. We're not just concerned about our students and classes. We care about the institution. All of the students, all of the families, the community, and society. We care about the goals of diversity, and we would like to seek solutions with you, with all of you. I believe part of the solution is greater awareness of the work that we do at Amherst Regional Middle School. I'm so pleased that the School Equity Task Force is interested in learning about what is being taught to broaden and deepen the learning of students about race, class, and other equity issues. And I appreciated Doreen Cunningham and the School Equity Task Force reaching out to ARHS and Erica Alshuler to learn about related coursework at the high school. The middle school is also happy to share with you the work that we are doing. In addition to the many examples of diversity and equity work under the leadership of Dr. Patty Bodie that were described in the letter from the middle school staff, I can share that this week, a snapshot is the seventh grade social studies teachers are engaged in our unit on diversity, which dovetails with the science department study of genetics. Students learn in both science and social studies that race is a social construct and not based in biological differences. This is the kind of work that makes us different it is imperfect, and we have these conversations with our students so that we can keep moving forward. The interdisciplinary studies that have been happening, that I just described, have been happening for years in the school. I share them as one more example of the work we do. It is a snapshot, a glimpse into our school, the rich and meaningful learning that takes place every day that continues our work of developing cultural competency and working towards social justice. We are committed to continuing this work. We want to continue this work, but we need your help in maintaining leadership that supports it and us. Leadership like we have now. We would like legal and ethical leadership that moves us forward. I'm hopeful to continue to carry on and sharing this good news with you. Thank you very much. Is there other public comment? If there's anyone else, please come forward. Again, identify yourself. You have three minutes. Um, my name is Patrick Sullivan. I'm the, one of the eighth grade science teachers at the middle school, and I um, I don't I don't really feel up to as up to speed as as probably everybody here um, is about the debate that's gone on and the discussion and the issues. Um, so I just I first want to admire everyone in the room and everyone who's spoken or hadn't spoken. Everyone here tonight for um, I, I guarantee everyone probably comes here with. Um, with best intentions for what's what's best for the kids in our in our classrooms and the kids in our homes and no matter what everyone's feeling right now or what people are are saying I just I really admire people for coming out um, for that um, so my my perspective really only only comes from um, and I know I'm not alone in the room on this but I I've worked in a handful of schools um, I attended a vocational agricultural high school. Um, I was I was able to work in Springfield, Massachusetts for a year, Holyoke um, for a little while. I've been teaching in Greenfield for almost a decade before. Um, I interviewed with Dr. Bodie, and so I've I've seen a lot of you know a few different kinds of schools, and I've had you know dozens of colleagues, and um, I just I I just want to encourage the district to exhaust all possibilities to allow the current administration at the middle school to continue its work because I've, I've never been a part of a group of individuals that has such energy um, and passion and self-reflection and expertise um, that they, they want to further the lives of every every kid in that school and I I'm, I'm there every day, I see it. I s it's a phenomenal environment to be around. And so I, that's the only thing I can really speak to is I, I think it's a profoundly powerful um, beginning at that school with the current administration. And I, I think the town and the, and the children, the kids that go there would be 
benefited um, massively if this this administration were able to keep its momentum that's that's getting started. So I just want to encourage the district to do everything it can to um, legally keep that going. So thank you. I guess following up with what Patrick uh, was able to share, um, I'm Tiffany Thibodeau. I'm a math teacher at the middle school and a resident of Amherst. Um, and I want to thank you, first of all, for listening to staff concerns um, as middle school um, to talk about middle school leadership in particular, um, especially at the May 8th school committee meeting. Um, my colleagues and I left feeling valued and feeling heard about the things we shared and our concerns going forward in the process. Um, today we return hopefully to learn from you about the steps that you're, you've taken in the interim and uh, the steps that you'll continue to take. And we're here again to just offer our support in partnership with a central office and the school committee and the community to look at ways in which we can build a strong leadership at the middle school and, con and continue the momentum as Patrick shared. Um, we care very much about this and we want to work with the community in order to make the process meaningful and for this to be successful we understand that it really does have to be a partnership. We also understand the requirements set forth by Massachusetts and by DESE and that we do need to have a licensed principal in July in place in July 1st. So we're not disregarding that fact. But we also want to consider that there are creative ways for us to come up with a solution that is legal and is ethical, that allows the middle school to retain leadership that will continue moving us in a positive direction. So we would like to sort of put forth the, the idea that as a group, we can work together and we have some possible suggestions and ideas of past practices and things going forward that may work um, that I would like to just submit to the public record. And we're sure that you guys have ideas as well and that we're looking forward to hearing. Um, I think it's also important for us to share that as a school, we understand that it's a work in progress. As a district, I know that we understand it's a work in progress. We know that it's not a perfect system yet, but I think every single person in this room, every single person in our district are working really hard to make sure that we're putting forth the best possible education that students can have, and I don't want to discredit that. Um, and I know that, that it seems like the, com the community feel might be that we have a disagreement about that, but I think it's very clear that even though we don't all agree on the solution to get there, uh, we do have that same interest in mind, and I think it's important for us to keep coming back to what's good for the students, regardless if it's a solution that makes us entirely happy. Okay, do I just hear Please, yeah, you? bring it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, right, right before you start, I should just say um, I want to make sure you know, every I, I want to make sure that everyone who wants to make a comment can, but we're also <coughs> Um, just by dint of reality, we're, we're probably, we're on 10 minutes away from uh, just doing an hour of the opening period of the meeting. And there's a lot of the stuff on the agenda, including the fact that we, again, for those people who've raised a number of the topics that have been raised tonight, one of our first items is in fact to talk more about that. So I want to try to move it along soon, but if there are a couple more people who want comments, I'm happy to do it. I wasn't trying to Stop I noticed, you, Eric, I just... that you, you said that before me, and you've had to gavel me no. before. So I noticed. <laughs> I noticed you saw so. me. So uh, my name is Melissa Giraud, and um, I don't have anything prepared, but I I I just I want to thank the teachers and the educators and you know in here because I think that something that gets lost oftentimes is just that um, education is a profession, and and by that I'm not saying. I'm not talking about licensure when I say that. I'm saying that there's a lot of experience and research and um, sort of skill that goes into that. I'm a former teacher as well. Um, so there are a lot of schools and districts you wouldn't want to work in, uh, others you would want to work in, and that's because of much more than the color of the superintendent's skin, right? So I think that in general, in the US, um, public education is really like a status quo machine. You know, the same people are being 
um, over-disciplined and not served, and there's this academic gap that's really about a resource gap and an opportunity gap. Um, and so what was so refreshing coming to Amherst not long ago was really meeting Mike and being shocked at how uh, sort of quietly radical I thought his, his uh, um, ideas were and his po in the policies he put forward and the integration, you know, the real integration as opposed to sort of diverse schools, real integration and the preschool and the whole thing he was trying to do. Um, I, w I was really wowed and surprised and waiting for it to not be true. And I've said this before, you know, so I just think that when um, it's sort of a, obviously he can't speak about, um, you know, what happens in that committee or why he didn't want, um, and I haven't heard any disparaging, I'd love to know, you know, those, those supposed rumors, I have not heard anything. Um, but it sort of ends up being, you know, him against com people complaining, and I don't think we're taking to, into account his record. Like, you need to take into account his record. He's shown us time and time and time again that he's an equity guy, that he's questioning so. You don't have that experience. Okay. Well, I I have that I have that experience, and um, I th I think we also have to realize that sure I'm a member of the community, you're a member of the community, and we are, our points of view are valid. But um, it's also true that there's a lot of that sort of research. What's really going on in the schools? Um, who's a better manager? All of that stuff. So it does come down to having faith to some extent. Um, because we weren't in the room, you know? And I just want to say that I, um, I've been pleasantly surprised by Mike Morris, and um, that's why in this moment I s continue to support him, because I, I, I think he went in there um, with, you know, all of this experience and uh, this will. He's sh shown me that he has the will to make things better here and to... Um, to counter bias and to counter inequity. So, um, yeah, again, it's a little bit emotional. I want to um, apologize to uh, the teachers again and educators. I did say I want to thank you, but I just think your voices aren't loud enough sometimes, um, and I want to elevate them. Vera Duongmini Cage, resident of Amherst, um, parent of two children in the school district, one at the high school and one at Crocker Farm. I um, echo the call to um, that we require ethical and um, legal leadership. I would like the school district to do an audit of our hiring practices, um, an audit of people who are principals and assistant principals and to require that we know um, their license numbers um, if their names cannot, or not obviously um, the legal names that are found in DESE. Um, I think the district is um, monitoring that, has always monitored that, um, and so I think the problem in my own research um, has been endemic and it's been institutional, it's been systemic, it's you know over long periods of time, way before um, our current superintendent um, took his position. Um, and I understand culture and culture and tradition, we, we, it repeats itself until someone like Chrissy Harmon you know, blows the whistle, blows the cover, and we are left to um, reconsider and think about what we've been doing in the past. And has it been legal? Has it been ethical? Um, have we been transparent? Um, can we be, do a better job you know, holding people accountable um, that are in charge of, of this information and these decisions of hiring and who gets appointed and the process? And, and, you know, um, you can Google that our district has policies in place around hiring different positions, um, and that DESE also has um, state requirements. And whatever process we engage in, um, 
I believe that we do need the voice of the state to let us know if that's in line, if, if we're in compliance. And, and I, I think that's what we all want. Um, I think we don't want the district um, held responsible or liable for decisions um, made from and by people um, that haven't um, satisfied the state's requirements to be in those positions. I do know of a student who was expelled, and I also want data accuracy reported to um, DASI. I would like to know why that one student's um, expulsion was not reported to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. At least it's not recorded in, um, in, on the website. I, I believe that um, when I hear concerns from parents that an administrator didn't, d didn't know what a 504 plan was, you know, I get concerned. Um, I think back of all the incidences we've had and it makes me question and, you know, why de certain decisions were made um, or allowed to happen. And to conclude, um, there's a lot of doubt out there in the community about leadership and um, do everything that's in your power um, to restore confidence in the district and to rectify and to be, you know, come in front of the, the truth that will eventually come out, right? Um, perhaps the superintendent can address in his remarks whether the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education are requiring us to provide information of all of our waivers that we've put in in the past. Um, if they're, you know, what other areas are they looking at with respect to hiring? And um, how we can, you know, proceed to do better and to be legal and to be ethical in the future. Thank you very much. So, um, with, oh, okay. This, this may be the last comment. Let's see no if any ideas. Emmer's resident, I'll keep it very brief. Just want to encourage the school committee to um, not treat these matters of uh, licensure and being in compliance with the law um, for our district in a cavalier manner. Um, these are, this should be baseline. This should be uh, just expected uh, within our district that these things comply or at least that the proper uh, procedures are in place, uh, waivers, what have you, um, that, that uh, and, and on a timely basis. I don't think we would allow this, the citizens, the taxpayers would allow this in, in our fire department. I don't think we would allow this in our police department for uh, em, uh, employees to not be in compliance with their jobs, with the duties and the requirements of their jobs, um, or any other facet of, of this town. I think least of all, then, we should uh, have a cavalier attitude toward these matters in uh, in regards to our schools I uh, do recall once uh, meeting with the previous uh, uh, school superintendent and uh, telling me that the number one reason there wasn't greater diversity greater ethnic racial gender or whatever sorts of diversity in our district was because of issues of licensure particularly the MTEL sat down with her, sat down with two other people from her administration, and that was the, the critical issue of why we couldn't, ha why we didn't have more, was because of MTEL and licensure. And so here we are and we find that we can uh, uh, skirt these protocol, we can skirt these matters, we can, we can uh, disregard a search committees that, that do due diligence to try and produce candidates with licensure and we just treat this as just like it doesn't matter. We, we, we want things the way we want things. Well, no, we don't live in a bubble. There are rules, there are regulations, and if it's, if it's fine for these things to be applied for why we don't have a more diverse faculty, then I think it needs to be fine at the administrative level as well and all across the board. This just should be baseline to be doing these things properly, and I hope that you as our elected officials will pay uh, serious attention to this and do your jobs. Thank you. I'm Sue Tippett, I'm the School Adjustment Counselor. I'm not gonna say my whole thing, but I wanna say one quick thing that I think is important for the community to know. Three people have lost their jobs because of this licensure issue. All women, two people of color, all very qualified and well-loved, proven administrators. So let's be clear about who's losing their jobs here. So, so I think, 
I, I'll, no, no, I'll just be 30 hold. seconds. Okay. Thank you. Introduce um, yourself, please. My name is Mick O'Connor. I teach at the middle school. I'm also an officer in the uh, APA. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for the hard work that you do. Uh, at times it can be uh, seem like there's not much pleasure in it, but thank you. Um, I have worked with Mike Morris uh, and under him and sat across the table for him. And I truly believe that he has the best interest of the children of this district at heart. And I felt it was um, a disservice to his person that he was characterized as a racist here at this meeting. And I would like any such inferred or um, overt statements that have been in the record to be scratched from the record uh, because of his record as a public servant and because of his decency as a human being. So thank you. So I'm going to close the uh, public comment section. Um, and Sorry? No, anyways, I'm just closing the public comment section. Uh, station, section. Um, are there any uh, announcements from the committee before we proceed? They obviously have a packed agenda. Mr. Sullivan. I'd just like to say thank you to Ms. LaRoche and any of the other teachers and staff that helped and assisted with those middle schoolers that went to the Amherst Town meeting and spoke about the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So thank you. Which passed unanimously, which passed unanimously by town meeting, which was cool. It's very cool. Uh, okay, so in, uh, with that, announcements are going to be closed. And are there any subcommittee updates? I know, exactly. All you have to do is transition out the person who always spoke on subcommittees. Uh, but I'll take that as an opportunity to move on also since we can catch up time a little bit. Um, Superintendent's update. And I know we're behind schedule, so I'll try to be brief. Um, say what you need to say. I mean, we're, we're here. Sure, I'll start with the good news. I want to start by thanking Amherst Education Foundation uh, for the next school year. They Sorry, go ahead. are offering $29,000 uh, in grants. And for those of you who don't know how AEF works, uh, teachers and staff from across the district can apply for grants. So the ones I'll mention are the regional ones. So Norm Price, who's here, actually, so I want to acknowledge him. Science teacher here at the middle school, or at the middle school, I should say, uh, had a grant for coding and robotics. Really exciting. Uh, I'm really excited about this and really connects back to, uh, in my opinion, a sabbatical um, that Mr. Price had. So there is a school committee connection that I try to find. Um, <laughs> but, but congratulations to Mr. Price and to our students who will get uh, an incredibly neat experience. Uh, $10,000 for restorative justice. Um, G.W. McRaven, who works at the high school, is a short, she's a longer title, but she works on restorative justice um, program there, and they've already started recruiting a diverse student's body to participate with her in that. And seven, uh, a little shy of $7,000 for the high school light board um, to Mr. Bechtold, who you've met a couple times. Uh, well needed for the performing arts department, so thank you to AEF, and thank you to the um, great many teachers. The, I know that AEF feels the worst part of their job is picking who doesn't get the grants, because they had um, more than twice the number of applications as they were able to fund this year. So I just want to publicly thank them again. Uh, in the last two weeks, so last Friday was the Black Scholars Rising event, um, and the Friday before was Latino Achievement Night. There were m multiple hundreds of people at each event. Um, I know some school members came as well, so thank you. I neglected to acknowledge Mr. Demling when I was up there last Friday, because I didn't see him, because there was a lot of people there. Um, but I think more importantly, just how important it is for the students in terms of having an affinity group celebration uh, incredibly valued, and, and the highlight for me last Friday was seeing the high school graduating seniors uh, put their stoles on that were um, given and talk about a person in their lives that got them to that place. And I think really interesting split, logically, I guess, perhaps, but um, between parents and staff and sometimes both. So sometimes it was someone's father 
and a guidance counselor, or it was a you know reading teacher and uh, a mother, and sometimes one or the other. But it's incredibly touching, and I've known some of those students since because I've worked in district well since they were literally in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So on a very personal level, it, it's very profound to see 13 years later what that looks like. Uh, and I know one of the middle school staff members was there and was saying, "Wow." You know, they leave us in eighth grade, and now they're like little adults. You know, and okay. and I think that's certainly what they were able to speak to. I think another unique part that I'll mention, in addition to some of the student performance for us standing, but they had eighth grade student, uh, middle school students talk to rising sixth grade, rising seventh graders about what it's like in the middle school, and two graduating seniors, seniors talking to the middle school students about what it's like. Um, so it was really powerful, um, and and thank you to all the folks who organize those events. Um, I'm going to skip ahead um, beyond what's typed. Um, this Saturday, um, the high school um, team that participates in the S Schools Mets Wits will be in the semifinals. So if you want to, if you're home on Saturday at 7 o'clock, worth watching and cheering on our, our students. And I think the Team Jaguar thing, Mr. Sullivan already spoke about uh, in terms of uh, acknowledging the students who came to Amherst Town Meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I had one more, which is I want to, you know, um, I know we did this via email, but celebrate that um, Talib Sadiq, who's been an employee of the district for the last 12 years, was appointed as the assistant principal at the high school, I think last Thursday. I think it was Cunningham for the date of when that was announced. In the last couple school days, it was, uh, I apologize. Uh, she's right, I'm sure, um, was announced. But uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled, and, and you know, Mr. Jackson led an interview process, and, and that recommendation came to me, and we're happy to uh, appoint Mr. Sadiq to the role. So uh, good luck to him, and, and congratulations to the high school to have him coming over. He's currently the middle school dean. Mm -hmm. so I, th I think we've had um, presentations on robotics or, or norm prices work and I know Mr. Bechtold has come here and I just was going to comment that we had a um, at a SETF meeting I was fortunate enough to be at the other day uh, along with Anastasia Ardenias um, uh, D.W. McRaven was there and was going over a lot of um, her work and um, actually given us a preview of the good fortune of the of the grant and what we discussed doing at some point um, Probably even in the fall, actually, is 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 engaging the school committee um, on a presentation because I thought that I mean I think we both thought it was very powerful work and it would be valuable for the committee to engage and maybe even uh, do a circle or something like that, which I think you've done right. Am I right about that? You are. It's incredibly powerful. That is experience. a superintendent update I'm looking for. On yes. How your experience <laughs> with the restorative justice program was. Yeah, absolutely. It's very cool. Um, so we can look forward to that hopefully at some point soon. Yep. Any other questions or comments from the committee for the superintendent as update? Seeing none, um, I think everything that the chair was doing is already embedded in the rest of the agenda. So there's no reason for me to do a report now. We're just going to keep keep going. Um, and we don't, I assume no one needs a recess or anything like that? No? Good. Then we will continue. Uh, so uh, the entire section is called licensure hiring, but it's broken down into um, subtopics: uh, licensure hiring process, middle school principal search, and search committee process, or search process committee rather. Excuse me. And my understanding is, uh, Assistant Superintendent Cunningham is going to be um, offering the presentation or leading the discussion. Is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> no, I'm just waiting for it to come up a little better. <laughs> okay, so there have been many questions about search process, waivers, and licensure. So, thank you. <laughs> So I just put the three topics that were on the um, agenda for today in the overview because I'm going to touch on three, but I'm going to stop after each one so that if the school committee has a question, you can ask me the question and then I'll move on to the next part. Okay. 
So when I started um, back in July of 2017, which was like 10 months ago, I looked and did basically an um, audit of what was going on. And I developed some goals. These are not all of the goals, but you know, I talked about or looked at how to hire, retain, and develop highly qualified staff here in, in our district. And most importantly, I looked at our licenses and our waivers. So I created an uh, entry plan, and some of my early action steps included the audit that I mentioned. And through this audit, we saw that there, or I saw that there were people who needed waivers, people who um, just needed help getting licensure. So I requested waivers for many individuals. 11 of those waivers were granted by DESE. And then I also met with the principals during admin week, and I spoke to them about the waiver process. So a couple of those slides that you'll see in this presentation will be the exact slides that the principals saw back in uh, August during admin week. I spoke to them about how DESE, um, what DESE looks for when you are requesting waivers and told them that since they're the ones who are in their building doing most of these hiring and searches, I wanted them to come up with the answers to the things that DESE was asking. And these are still ongoing and active conversations that I'm having with our administrators as to not, as to first looking for people who are licensed as opposed to saying, hey, I hired this person and now they need a waiver. So once again, when I started, I spoke to the administrators and I said, look for the most qualified, right? I, I had felt at the time when I did my audit that, um, and, and they laughed when I said this, but I said it was like, oh, and you get a waiver, you get a waiver, and you get a waiver. And that was not going to continue to happen while I was here. So, you know, um, I explained to them that whoever was serving under a waiver, that their position would have to be reposted. And that they would have to show six progress points so that they can, um, if they are going for a second year worth of a waiver. So the six progress points, it could include taking a full MTEL and passing it. That's like two points. If they only pass one portion, then it's one point. So if it's like common lit, communication and literacy, and they pass the whole thing, that's two points. If they only pass the literacy and not the other part, that's one point. Also taking a college course could be uh, considered points towards the, the progress points that DESE required. And I also explained to them that it's kind of a disservice for teachers to work under waivers because they're not getting any um, time towards professional teacher status. So these were the things that I explained to the administrators that DESE needed them to answer. So if they did a search and they decided to hire someone who was not licensed, I needed them to explain to DESE all of these points. Because DESE says the lack of experience is not a skill, knowledge, or ability deficit. So they want to know why are you hiring a person who is not licensed over and, and requesting a waiver over a licensed person. Okay. I also spoke to the educators who were on a waiver or who needed a waiver. Every educator who needed a waiver met with me. So let me back up for a second and say that I also spoke to many of the administrators who were only on initial licenses and urged them to go and get professional licenses. So I did do that with the administrators and then I sat down with every individual who was on a waiver or needed a waiver or was working in the district and needed a license. <clears throat> we created a plan of action. This is back in August. We created a plan of action. I um, didn't just look and say, well, you know, According to DESE guidelines, this is what you need. I called DESE specifically with the MEPID number of each individual, and I sat with them and I said, this is what DESE says. At times, I was on the phone with DESE with the individuals in my office. I offered them an opportunity to 
work with a mentor. I offer them uh, op opportunities to work as a cohort or and work with me um, monthly with individual meetings. I also express to them what the six progress points would look like and how they can attain these progress points. And I let them know without a doubt that their position would be reposted and that they were not earning um, professional teacher status while they were on this waiver. So I know there were also questions about what information is on the DESI site. And um, so there's the public lookup portion where you can look and you can find the licenses and, and what um, people are licensed under, um, the percentage of staff members who are licensed, the, profession, uh, the percentage of persons of color who are working in our district and every other district in the state of Massachusetts. And you can find information from previous years. You can do any kind of comparisons that you want. And you can even get lost on the website just if you're a data person and just keep clicking buttons or you know tabs, you'll get lost because there's so much information on that site. So here's a sample of some of the things that you can find on the DESI site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I know one of the questions um, posed previously was, what is our percentage of staff who are licensed? I only pulled up the percentage at the regional level since this is a regional meeting. And the percent of our teachers in our district at the regional level compared to our state is a little higher, right? It's not 100%, but we're working towards it. And when we look at our surrounding districts, because you know you might say, okay, well, where does that fit with, um, let's say, Northampton or Greenfield or Holyoke? So I look back. Northampton is 99.8%. Granby, Hadley, South Hadley, Belchertown, they're at 100%. Greenfield is at 97% and Holyoke is at 90%. So just to let you know where we fit within our area. Also, as um, was brought out, sometimes you may go on that public license lookup because you want to find out if a certain person has a license or not. And your result might come up where it says your search returned no results. So that could happen for many reasons. Either the name may not be entered correctly, like someone may get married and now uses their maiden, uh, their, their married name, and you've only known them under their maiden name, so you're putting in the maiden name and it's different, so you won't get an answer. Um, the other thing to note is the license effective date. So DESI licenses, such as your professional license, your initial license and such, usually last for five years. But that doesn't include any gaps in employment. So if you were licensed through DESI in 2012 and it's on the public lookup site and you didn't start working under that license till 2014, you still have time, right? Because there were two years that you didn't work under that license. So you add that two years. And so the public would not know that you have two additional years outside of what you see on the site. And also, it's the educator's responsibility, not HR, not the district, to maintain their license and submit a renewal application in a timely fashion. Another point is just that in private school or substitute teaching, that also um, wouldn't work towards time under your license. So if you're a sub or you're working in a private school, that time does not count towards the five years. So just a quick recap, when I started back in July 1st, 2017, I did do an audit and reviewed the status of everyone's license and spoke to individuals about their license and how they can move to the next step. And I'm working on getting our district to 100% like some of those surrounding towns. And I'm going to continue with the trainings for administrators, especially now that we have the search process committee and we're you know, creating some protocols for our district. It's going to be great, the things that we're doing in that, and we're going to continue with training our administrators on that new process and working towards, like I said, that 100%. So with this being said, are there any questions? Mr. Menino, <clears throat> I did listen to your slide presentation, but I'm still unclear as to how a teacher gets a license. Did they take a test? 
There are lots of different ways. So they can go to the university and take courses and then through the university get licensed, like um, some of our paras, like we talked about, the para pathways. Um, there, there are just other ways. Um, through, we have ARPS University and we have training programs that the district has always had in place where they help to train people to become licensed educators, especially under, um, let's say, if we find that they, we have a need for special education licenses, we might do a program or a cohort to get the special education license. There's the li been, go ahead. Is the license perpetual or finite? Five years. There are other Every five years there's a renewal. Thank you, yeah. sorry. I, I was gonna ask for other questions, sorry. The other questions from the committee? Mr. Demling? Um, I just wanna thank you for that very detailed presentation. I was not aware that you were so on top of this from the very beginning. Um, I really, really appreciate that this was uh, astutely on your radar from the very beginning, um, that you met with every individual on a waiver, that you were in such close contact with Desi. Um, gives me even more confidence that you have your eye on the ball and that you brought your expertise that we, that we knew you had, your past experience to our district. Um, um, I, guess, uh, I guess just one question is, um, you know, as, as, we, as we work towards the, the goal of 100%, um, um, do you see any, any additional things that, you, know, you mentioned ARPS University and working with every individual, any additional things? I mean, it sounds like um, you've had a level of, of attention to this since July that maybe wasn't as, there in the past. Um, so I was wondering going forward if there's, you know, what other plans there are for, to get there. So yes to that and, um, one person, one speaker um, during public comment br did talk about the MTELs and the struggle to pass that. So we have been working with Mount Holyoke to help some of our educators, not just the paras who are in the program, but all of our educators who are in need of that, especially those who are on the waiver, to be able to take the course in our building. Um, we have it at the middle school, and they're taking the courses there. There's a teacher there who, who does it after school. And um, we do help pay for one, MTEL um, testing period. And so, you know, knowing that that's a struggle for many and a barrier for many, we are working through that. Um, there are other ways, you know, it just depends on whatever the individual needs. So I, I don't like to speak in generality, so that's why I sit with everyone and, and, and work with them with a plan. So going forth, I will still sit individually and create a plan. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Cunningham, I just want to say thank you um, also for putting together this presentation. And as I mentioned uh, during our last school committee meeting on this topic, um, you know, you and I had sat down during the summer when you first started and you shared with me a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. And I think I probably didn't state it strongly enough, um, so I will today, how much I appreciate the um, professionalism that you have brought to this position and how closely you have paid attention to the detail with all of this, uh, with licensure, understanding how important it is for our district to maintain um, both the you know, state level regulation, but also what our community has asked of you and it has asked of our school committee. And that is what I uh, was stating at the last meeting. I think that is incredibly um, important to have someone like you in that role because I think you came in with an eye towards understanding that maybe a system that was not fully 100% um, that you could get it there. And I also appreciate the fact that has come through with this presentation in particular, but also I think just from my conversations that I've had with you, the great sensitivity that you have brought to this, understanding that you know, these are people's jobs, many of them are very well loved in their schools, um, and that you have provided pathways of support for them to ensure that they are able to get the licenses that they need um, as opposed to just a hard-nosed approach, which I definitely appreciate, having gotten to know a lot of these educators myself and some of these administrators. Um, but I think providing pathways of support and ensuring that um, we bring them along as opposed to just you know, sort of uh, shoving them aside if they're not getting where they need to be as soon as they can. So I really appreciate, in particular, the description of the six points of, you know, um, of a process that you described there before and uh, just the different ways that the district has been supporting all of those licensure um, pathways. So thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? Yes, like Spitzer. 
I would also just like to really thank you for explaining this, especially as somebody who's new to this role. Um, I had a lot to learn about licensing, licensure and have been learning. Um, and I'd also just like to point out, I think this really shows how proactive you've been in addressing this issue and that it's not purely a reaction to what's been going on in the community. And I think so much has been going on that it's sometimes difficult to to see how we've actually been, or at least the district's been paying attention to this issue. And so I, I just really appreciate the time you spent kind of clarifying the timing of this and, and the steps that we've been taking um, to try to get up to that 100% goal. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, so I think my, my the comments I'd add, I echo what was said before, that I really appreciate the depth, and I also appreciate the time you've taken walking through the different steps. And um, since I tend to be fairly plain spoken, I'm probably going to echo some things that Ms. Odonia said, but not say them as eloquently as she did. Um, that, you know, in my mind, there are, are a, a couple of positions that are, are broadly taken, I think, in the community at this point. Um, and I'm not talking about any individual, but I'm, so I'm sort of simplifying positions. And one of them, I think, might be the notion that um, a concern over this question of licensure and waiver, uh, to the extent that it's becoming more visible now in terms of how it's being administered, um, is um, sort of coming late and fast and immediate on the one hand. Uh, and um, and I think echoing something that was said before, there's no question that for uh, anyone, to, regardless of what the career decisions are making or where they've been right now, um, it's going to create a lot of deep feeling in the community. Um, there's just simply no question about that. And um, I think the other general position in the community broadly speaking, would be that um, there hasn't been enough concern about the question of, of how we balance the different qualities that we're looking for in individuals and how that relates to adherence to state law and regulation around licensure. And one of the things I really appreciate that I think gives an enormous amount of clarity to that overall discussion and public understanding is that since last summer, at the very least, um, that A, you have in fact um, done, you know, I think excellent professional, who am I to say? But I guess since I'm sitting here to the school committee, I guess I have a right to say this. Um, excellent professional work diagnostically, but also that you had a plan of action um, that uh, was intended to do two things. One, to I think improve and remediate practice to the extent that it needed to be. And then two, also, and this echoes something Zidonia said, ensure that the people who were in place um, were both appropriately licensed or waived and then supported in um, their career pathways. And I think that's exactly what we want to do. But I also just think that by articulating um, three things, one, that timeline and, and the different steps, but also two, that you're also not talking about a static goal. So for anyone in the public uh, who's looking at this and is trying to understand what the district is doing right now, um, it can be clearly stated. You said you want to have, uh, if we can get there, as soon as we can get there, 100% of our staff, which would mean administration and teachers, um, fully licensed. Uh, and then obviously on top of that, anyone looking at hiring would add a number of other qualities we'd look for in our staff above that. And I think that's, so uh, I, don't, I don't know at the moment that you're looking for a particular endorsement from the committee to this direction. Um, so without a vote, I'm not going to say it, but I think you can telegraph my opinion that I think it's, a, <laughs> it's probably a good thing. And, and more importantly, that, the, that there's a level of stability of direction and leadership that if we look at this, I, just, I think it's important because I actually don't want anyone, if we need to change course, mm -hmm. we change course. If we need to admit mistakes, we should always make admit mistakes. Where there's learning to be done, we should do it and then even share it. But also I think it's, it's an, an important thing that where we are in fact on a pathway which is developmental and appropriate, um, we should articulate it because I, I think one of the most important things, one, one of the more important values anyone would want 
who's either working in the district or sending their kids to the district would be to know that there is, in fact, that adherence and fidelity to pra mm -hmm. best practice and the law, but also an environment that is stable, nurturative, and professional. And I think that's what you were describing a moment ago, and I appreciate it. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether it's necessary. Oh, you have your hand up. I do. When you're awesome. Then I'll stop. <laughs> I, I should. I should have summed like the point that the flags were waving and the violins were rising or something like that. But I, I never know when to do that. So, Ms. Gusansky. Um I just had two follow-up questions from your presentation. Um, it sounds like um, after your review, there were probably some changes um, that the district wanted to make to ensure hiring going forward would be more compliant um, with licensure. And I'm just wondering if that also involved um, clarifying roles and responsibilities during the hiring process for who's checking um, for licensure status and following up prior to um, hiring the individual or offering a position. Right. So, so as mentioned, it, the, it is an ongoing conversation. It is an ongoing um, work. It is ongoing work that we are doing, and um, we started. I think the last time I mentioned that, even just changing our job description to say we're looking for licensed candidates was a first step. And now I've sent to um, most, and still working on getting it to all administrators that public lookup site, so that prior to them inviting someone for an interview, they can look to see what that person has. And so yes, and it's an ongoing work that we're doing. Thank you. So I have another question. Uh, or I have a question, I guess, because mine earlier, that wasn't really a question. It was more just a long statement. Um, uh, so um, is there anything that we did when we were applying for waivers last summer that could have been improved upon, or anything you'd like to discuss around that process? Well, we can. Um, if you can go to the last slide. Sorry. So there is a question as to um, the waiver request saying that there was only one candidate, and I do have to own that error in some aspects because coming becoming new to this system, I'm also new to School Spring. Where I'm coming from, we didn't use School Spring, so I was adept with another uh, platform. And the person who trained me showed me you go into, if you can, I don't know if we can move it over or what, but when you go into School Spring and you look at the job postings, you can go back to the job that's, that you're looking for to see who, who applied. And this was the screen I had gotten for some of them. And so in the site it says title and all of that, and then it tells you the name. So this tells me who has applied. And so I saw one, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Only one person applied for this particular position. And so when I requested some of the waivers, it did just say that this person was the only applicant. But then I was um, months later when I received some additional training, then I was told to go into the activity log that you see at the side. Yes. Right down in the bottom. Right. Of the so I was able to go into the activity log. So I did get some school spring training so that I can understand this platform a whole lot better so that right. when I do any kind of reporting, which I don't plan to for any waivers going <laughs> forward, um, that I can do the reporting accurately. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it nice? Um, just one question. You mentioned something about um, <clears throat> training administrators to use the platform to check on licenses if they are going to be hiring anyone in the future. You had mentioned previously that sometimes that can be tricky because of people's right. names change. So I'm just curious, you know, how do you train for the gaps in a system that we, we, we use overwhelmingly, right? Like if there's, you know, there's problems like that. Is there a way to go around it, go to DESE directly, if you can just describe that process? So I'll say this much with, with that question. Um, yes, I do. I sent them the link so that they can go on and look up publicly, but nothing is, is easier than to call the client themselves or the potential candidate themselves and say, hey, do you have a license? You know, and send it to me so that they can submit that license. Many of the candidates or potential candidates upload their license, mm -hmm. but sometimes you just have to call them and say, do you have that license if you don't find it on the public lookup site? Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there other questions? And by the way, I just want to, um, I guess I'll just say this out loud. Uh, it's, it was my intention that we 
to the extent we need to exhaust the subject and ask as many questions as we need to to feel to be I mean I, 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 as I said my personal opinion is I think is Cunningham already did an exceptional job presenting everything but I'm just simply saying that if there's a sense that there are questions out there that we think we would like to have a good public answer to I'd rather do this now then I mean, I'm being really blunt. By the way, this is what transparency looks like. I'm being really transparent. I'd rather do this now than have this on the agenda every week for the next, you know, every every meeting for the next six weeks, so that we serially raise questions that we don't bother answering when we're meeting. So that's why I'm keeping asking if you guys have any questions. If you don't, we'll obviously move on. But I just want to make sure we really have an open discussion, get good answers, and feel confident about what we're doing. So don't we? So, so in that spirit of exhaustiveness, um, so I, I guess I just had a general ex uh, question for, for Ms. Cunningham. So I mean, so I look to you as like the expert on interpreting these license regu regulations, and I think in, in the public sort of understanding of of what has happened and some of these subtopics relate, um, there have been many opinions expressed uh, on a wide variety <laughs> um, of well, just the general issue, issue of licensure, and I'm sure you've heard. Um, many of many of this commentary. So, just to know if there was anything else lingering in the public discussion in your uh, in public commentary over the last weeks, uh, etc. Uh, but you've heard that you would just want uh, the public to really understand about licenses or misconceptions that you know, based on your expertise and past experience, you would you think is important for for the, the lay person to know. That's a good question, and I don't have an answer to that <laughs> <laughs> because I um, no matter what I say there's always going to be another question, right? And so, you know, unless we let the public get up and ask questions again, I, I really wouldn't know what to anticipate more than what I, I did here. So I'm hoping that this is the end of all of this questioning about that. But, you know, I, I do say to the public that they can send me an email if they have a specific question. You know, I, I don't mind answering emails. Sounds good. Oh, sure. um, so just, um, I think in the, in my spirit of continuous improvement, um, where, and you said it was an ongoing conversation, but I'm wondering um, maybe what the timeline for that might be, where do you think our next steps are in terms of um, improving um, the training, improving the, um, you know, the process and sort of defining what our best practice is um, so that that knowledge doesn't just reside with you, but that it becomes institutional knowledge about how um, how we want to hire people going forward. Or even as it also relates to the pathway program, we're going to be encouraging um, those people to get licenses, um, ideally, so that they'll be able to work at different positions that um, within our district. So how we institutionalize that knowledge. <clears throat> so, you know, when I mentioned ongoing, it, it really is like um, I'll send out an email and say, send me all the questions that you intend to ask your, can your potential candidates. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say, tell me who's on your hiring committee or search committee so that I can see if the um, committee is reflective of who should be on a search committee. Mm -hmm. um, then I, I try to sit in on many of the interview, as many of the interviews as possible, just to then go back and give feedback to anyone who I can, you know. Uh, but we also have the time in August when we have admin week and there's more, like more um, hours of everyone sitting there and hearing the same message at one time. Mm -hmm. So I know definitely in August during admin week that'll take place, but through my continual emails and, and just going into the buildings and talking to people and and, and just um, trying to make sure that we're all on the same page. But also as we get further into this conversation, we're gonna look at the, the search process committee and they have some recommendations that are coming out that I will have to train our administrators on. So you know that's, that's going to be sooner <clears throat> rather than later too, because we're still hiring for the next year. Great, uh, anything further from the, Mr. Menino? One year from now, I'd appreciate an update on this. I'd like to update you sooner than one year from now, <laughs> Mr. Menino. Okay. Okay. So the other bullet talked about the middle school search process. Um, once again, we had 
Dr. Morris and I had mentioned that we sat down with the middle school and um, met with them twice to just talk about what they were looking for and let them know where we were going as a district for um, as, as far as filling that position. So when we met with them the second time, the middle school staff asked, can they participate in how the job description is written or, you know, um, just give ideas or what have you on, on the job description. So a survey was sent to them the next day. The survey um, asked about maybe six or seven questions, and it asked them what were they looking for as far as the qualities or attributes that they would like to see in a middle school principal. And I, I got to back up and say that the survey didn't only go out to the staff, it went out to families and just people who are connected to the middle school. Um, we received over 100 responses from that, and that's a great response rate based on how many students and um, staff are in the middle school. So with that, I'll say over 60% of the response came from incoming or current family members, and a um, little over 35% came in from the middle school staff. So after that, we read through the responses. We then created the position and posted it. It was posted on the 14th with a deadline of June 1st as the, um, the final date for anyone to apply. We do have seven applications so far. And we have a tentative timeline. So the search, com the search or process review committee is still working. We've been really sitting there and coming up with a, a plan that I'm hoping in June we can sit in front of you and explain what our new or revised hiring process will be. So we've been doing the work. Um, for, thank you to the committee members for all their time that they've put in outside of the school day. And so we have now a tentative timeline for hiring that middle school person. This is just a, a visual, a chart of who replied. And it was just showing um, over 60% of the incoming or current parents um, replied. And faculty and staff was a little over 35%. So here's our search timeline. The position was posted. We plan to send out a letter to ask people if they are interested in joining our interview slash screening committee. So that letter should be going out by this Friday with a deadline of them um, being able to respond by June 1st. Then we will continue our work up until June 25th when we plan to have an announcement of who is being appointed to the position. Oh, sorry. sorry, just a clarifying question. So <clears throat> what we're talking about here, and this is for the members of the public and the community that are, that are mm -hmm. listening, is the interim principal. The not, interim, not the two-year interim. Not the permanent principal. Not the permanent, the two-year interim principal search. This is the timeline for that position. Thank you. Okay. Oh, it is the time for questions. You had a look <laughs> on your face like you were ready for questions, but I was waiting for the slide that said <laughs> questions. Uh, Mr. Demling. Um, so thank you for that overview and that timeline. Uh, it's very helpful. Um, so two questions. Um, uh, I, I, and you can cycle back to my second question if you want, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, so, so one thing um, that I wanted just to hear, hear a clarification from on, from your words is, is specifically the, the responsibilities and authority of the search committee as it relates to the hiring manager. So from my perspective, this is pretty clear. I, and that's probably because I've served on principal search committees and teacher search committees in our district before, and as, as a member of the public, school governance council, et cetera. Um, and my understanding has always been is that the, the search committee, sometimes referred to as a interview committee, sometimes referred to as a hiring committee, responsibility is to, is to take a number of uh, candidates that have been um, provided uh, by human resources, uh, interview those candidates, and then recommend a slate of finalists to the hiring manager. So in the case of a teacher, this would be to the building principal. In the case of uh, the middle school principal, it's to the, the superintendent. Um, and at that point, the superintendent um, will then do a further in-depth background check. And not just calling listed references, but 
you know, doing all of the due diligence things you would do in HR to really vet a finalist candidate, Google search, uh, con um, contacting people who might, um, who you might know through your own professional social networks, reaching out, gathering that information, and then making a determination as to whether to bring that finalist's set forward to the, to the public. Um, I, th I think part of the, um, the ajna of, of how the middle school process principal search happened is, is some public misconceptions about the role and authority of that search committee. So if you could just maybe clarify that, if my understanding is correct. So if I'm hearing you correctly, your understanding is correct. Um, we, the search committee does make the recommendation to the superintendent. And that's where our job basically ends. With the new process that we're doing, um, I'm just going to like spill a little bit of the beans, but this takes place prior to, so the superintendent is in the process earlier, right? Because now we have him at the end of the process making that decision. So yes, because of, uh, Desi does give the superintendent that authority to make that final decision, He's, he and uh, we checked many other districts have always kept the superintendent to the end, whereas now with some of what we're doing, we're moving him further up in the process so that he can make these decisions and, and meet the candidates and such and, and look to do the things that you were talking about earlier in the process to uh, lessen the opportunity or the chance of a failed search. Which, which of course is a preview of section number three <laughs> of our presentation. Is there, I mean, a, you probably have another question, Mr. Demling. I know Mrs. Gusensky had one she wanted to ask. I also just going to remind I me, mean, ask whatever you want. It's an open committee. But also saying if we're talking about the section of literally the current middle school search. So my question, I, I think Doreen started to answer, which is if you went back to the timeline slide that we're proposing, um, where in this new process or in the process that we're using for the interim middle school search are we um, – doing that check for licensure and um, those things that we talked about in the first section of, of how do we make sure candidates are licensed before we um, put a lot of effort into the finalist piece of that. Right, so in the middle where it says week of June 4th, the work begins, mm -hmm. it happens right there, mm -hmm. and it also happens the week of June 11th where it says the names are forwarded to the superintendents. Right. Mr. Medina? You said the superintendent was designed to be involved earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. According to that timeline, does that mean before the recommendation is made to him, before June 11th? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Devlin? So, uh, um, so, Mr. Chair, this question is about the, uh, how the previous middle school search? The, the, the Ask whatever you okay. want. Okay. I, was just, I was just trying to point out that okay. the third section was on process okay. changes. Um, so this is a question from Ms. Cunningham, and, and I understand if you can't answer this question, um, but I just want to attempt to ask it. Um, so, um, so when the finalist set is recommended to the hiring manager, the hiring manager may uh, elect to, to remove candidates from that finalist pool, add candidates to the finalist pool, not present the entire finalist pool to the public, as, as was the case in this situation. Um, and, and, and in this case, Dr. Morris has, has described that the, he's not going to share the reasons um, because we're talking about individuals' personal employment information. And it would not be fair to those candidates who apply for our district to say, well, this person applied for this job and we didn't select them as finalists. Not just because there might be skeletons in the closet, right, but because that, that's not good for, for a candidate. And, and that would actually discourage people from applying to our district, qualified candidates, if they knew that if they didn't get the position, it was going to be... <laughs> All in the news, so I, I totally understand that, um, you know, and, and yet from some, and I don't want to characterize what percent because I think it's very difficult with the proximity bias of public comment to ascertain just what percent of the public is feeling one way or the other. But there, you know, some voices have raised the, the concern about about diversity and was 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 racial consideration part of the calculus. And so I'm not asking you to share details. Um, but, but in your position as Assistant Superintendent, Director of HR and Equity, you know, in, in your conversations, are you comfortable that the, the, the decision-making process to not bring the finalists forward was, was appropriate in, in those respects? If 
you can answer if you like. You don't or not. I mean, it's, <laughs> so, it's, so I don't think you. I'll say two things. Um, thank you. I, I do agree that that would be a mic question to answer, you know, his process. But I also would say that, um, so people interviewed, right? And um, some did well, some didn't, right? And at the end of the day for the search committee, it came down to a, a license, right? That, that was it for the search committee. We forwarded some names, and um, as Desi says, the superintendent has whatever right to make a decision, and that was what was done. So um, I think that, uh, that other part goes to Mike, but I, I, I am okay with where we are because we're moving forward, right? And many of those applicants who were not moved forward previously have um, an opportunity now to come again and say, you know, and, and be a part of this if they so choose. So, you know, I don't know if um, Dr. Morris would like to respond to that, but that's, that's as much as oh, I'm able to say. I, um, you know, it's an interesting challenge as a matter of public process. Yeah. To and I, I'm I would frankly caution the committee about asking someone to defend a, the private contents of their head in a way that suggests. And I know there's process and it was looking up things or whatever, but I think it's it's not prudential in any way I can think of, especially because you can do that pretty much to anyone. You meet on the street about anything that you might think. Uh, there's, if, if there's an occasion to have a process in which we could deliberate over that question, then that would be the appropriate venue, I think. Could I ask um, maybe a, a, a slightly different question, but I think um, is related, um, which is um, what are, I guess it's, two-part question, specifically for the interim posting, but I think also just in general in our best practices for hiring, how are we reaching out and ensuring that we get a diverse pool of candidates? Um, because in my mind, um, it, you know, I think there was general agreement in the public that we want the, the best teachers and staff and administrators for our students, and it's important that those uh, teachers and staff and administrators um, start to look more and more like our student body. Um, and I'm confident that if we continue to provide qualified candidates to hiring managers, they will make the right choices. So what are we doing um, to make sure that we have the most diverse pool of candidates? Is there outreach that we're doing? Are we advertising in, um, you know, non-standard publications that might reach different uh, groups of qualified candidates? So <clears throat> now that I am a lot more adept with SchoolSpring, I know how to do the search to find uh, people of color, and I have reached out to the majority of people of color who are licensed in the state of Massachusetts for a principal slash assistant principal um, position. And um, not only via email, but pri uh, personal phone calls too, which also helped because um, just to step back a second, the last search did um, gain a lot of people of color into that pool doing the same thing, right? So since it worked, I have been making those calls, I have been reaching out, I have been using SchoolSprint and doing that back search. I've also um, added to some of the places that we have advertised for. For, um, for instance, um, there's a person who works with MSAN, and she has allowed me to advertise with her, and um, so she's doing some re outreach for that community. Um, I've ad um, reached out to the five colleges, and, um, and of course, SchoolSpring feeds into Indeed. So I am willing to hear other places that I can, you know, reach out to if anyone has a suggestion, but so far, those are the things that we have been doing. Thank you. Other questions? So I guess I have another one. Um, the, 
uh, again, in the spirit of saying there's lots of questions and exhausted, and obviously if the superintendent wants to say anything, you can raise your hand and feel free to speak forward uh, as, you, as you well as you do all the time at other meetings, so you know about that. Um, so uh, the, what, as we've heard things tonight, um, that we're on a track to search for and identify a two-year interim uh, with uh, presumably then a pathway you'd mentioned in the last meeting, a series of sort of, you know, major things that were going to be worked on and things like that globally that you thought affected the uh, overall environment and organization of the middle school that you thought um, lend itself towards having an interim. I just, w I guess I'm asking the question mainly because we've heard it asked, <laughs> is um, whether you have anything to add or anything to say or uh, any anything that elaborates upon your thinking around this could be particularly for the superintendent, I guess, but either one of you uh, on that current plan. Because because I say this obviously because as we I say that I bring this up because again in the spirit of where we're going, um, uh, we could end this meeting tonight, and I think people would have learned a lot of things that are interesting and many people would consider hopeful around licensure, professional development, and practice. Um, they would hopefully in the next section learn some really wonderful things about search processes and how we're sort of organizing that. Um, but one of the things people are going to walk away with is an interest in saying, so is th so this is really the plan, right? We're going to hire a two-year interim principal at the middle school and then other things will flow from there. And so I, I, w I wanted to put a fine point on that if that was the current thinking. And obviously I just we just saw the timeline, so I'm not questioning it. But I, I really thought there needs to be a moment for some comment, if you have one. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Um, so I think the practical matter for many families who either have a sixth grade student currently or a seventh grade student uh, currently that I've continued to hear as well as from the staff lens is uh, how, do, how does the middle school move forward? And how do we ensure that there's high quality leadership? Uh, to support the high-quality educators we have in the middle school on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's not to just take away from the process pieces that are essential that have been the thrust of the presentation so far and even will be more so in the next, uh, the third part of Ms. Pre Cunningham's presentation. Um, and so our focus has been to, uh, as Ms. Cunningham described, run that search process and then very soon after get the, um, the candidate who was chosen in to really work through the summer on middle school needs, inventory um, the strengths and challenges of the middle school, and hit the ground running when we get to fall. Um, so I think uh, the timeline works well in that um, the person will be hired right as there's a little more space for some of that professional development and support to come from Ms. Cunningham, myself, as, as well as colleagues like Mr. Jackson and, and other folks. I think the other order of business that will need to be sorted out very soon after that person's hired is what's the leadership model going to look like at the middle school more generally. And um, I want to be explicit that that person we hire needs to be a critical player, critical, critical voice in how to think through that. We're looking for people with experience in middle school environments who uh, wouldn't just be passive listeners to the thoughts that we have, but act active participants in that discussion. Um, as announced earlier, Mr. Sadiq, who's in a dean role, which is uh, not administrative, but certainly on the leadership aspect of the middle school, we're heading to the high school. So there's a number of vacancies that we'll have to sort out and trying to think of the best model for um, leadership in the middle school would be the kind of first order of business when the person is hired and may actually become part of the interview process um, to gather some thoughts about how to think through that and how to make sure staff, students, and families feel supported as the school year dawns on us um, in late August. So. That's really the kind of very intentional focus of hiring the right person who can bring um, that skill set and that set of expertise, both to middle school, but also more generally to think about leadership structures, because um, that, that's going to have to be sorted out pretty early in the summer. Okay. Ms. Kusinski? Just a, a follow-up question as I was listening to your explanation. Um, I'm wondering, um, we're needing to hire an interim, and yet we're also looking them for them to be um, a very much a leader and and being able to embrace change and drive a school and I'm wondering if that will make it challenging to find somebody who wants to just have an interim position or are we also offering them the possibility that this is something that could be a permanent position if it works out I'm just wondering you know 
when you have those interim titles, you know, you, you're not necessarily attracting people who want to stick out for the long term and take on some of those challenges. Can we just start? give you a break? Um, yeah, so uh, it's something that Ms. Cunningham and I spoke an awful lot about, and we intentionally didn't have in the posting that it would be, the person would be precluded from applying for a permanent role after the two years for some of the reason that you suggested. I also think that there's, I hear the, the concern expressed, but there's, all, there's a flip side to that, which for some people, they love being in one or two year roles because they, they thrive off that. It's a very different perspective that one would have as opposed to looking at a more permanent appointment. And it also can sometimes attract retired, people who are recently retired who want to, you know, they still want to work, um, but this is an opportunity to do something um, that's a little unique and different from their prior experience. So. Um, as Ms. Cunningham, we said we have a number of applicants so far. Um, my vantage point has been excited about the applicants, some of the applicants that we have in the pool from, a, you know, a mm -hmm. distance. I haven't met any of them. Obviously, the process hasn't gotten to that place. Um, but I don't know if you'd like to add. I don't know. Yeah, please. I was just going to agree that um, with us putting on the job description that it is an interim role, only those who are interested in an interim role are looking to apply. So it, it weeds out a lot of, of people who wanted to stay, right? Mm -hmm. And if it so happens that when we are, depending on whatever model we come up with, if we do look for a permanent principal for that school, then um, we're not saying that this person can't then apply for the permanent position. Thank you. So we can move. Well, Ms. Adonias, Mr. Dillon. So I just want to make sure that the person that we are bringing into an interim position is set up for success and that the person who comes in following their footsteps is also set up for success, right? So that we have, you know, an easy transition, I guess, from that interim role into the permanent role. And I guess it could go a couple of different ways where the person in the interim role is charged with you know, soliciting input from the community, both the parents, families, you know, caregivers, but also from the educators in the building and, you know, from anyone sort of in the building, um, the school community. And that's their primary role is, is basically, you know, receiving information, setting up a system by which they can hear out where the priorities are, you know, kind of identify perhaps, you know, some of the tensions or gaps that may exist. And, and there's always in, in any work environment that always exists. And then not fully cooking anything, but, but instead providing that information almost raw with you know, a solid set of recommendations, <coughs> excuse me, to that, that person that comes in the, in the permanent position so that that person then can take that information and, and go with it, right? And you know, that there's not this feeling of this interim person who came in and fully cooked a plan of action and then handed it off to this other, you know, the permanent position. And the reason why I raise that is because, you know, I guess my concern too is in thinking about, you know, uh, professionals that we're bringing into these roles and also in particular, I think people of color that we're bringing into these roles, that we want to make sure that they're not frustrated by a system that we may have inadvertently set up to somehow make them almost defunct as soon as they set foot in that, in that role, right? And so I just, you know, I, I guess it's more a thought to share with you and to share with the rest of the committee as we continue to think about this position and how it evolves, if we can continue to touch base with each other to make sure that this interim position is, is uh, contributing in, you know, in the long term to the success of the permanent position, whether that it's the same individual or not. Um, but that they, we're cognizant of that, that we may be end up, you know, we may in inadvertently end up setting up something that could cause that permanent person to fail, right? And so I just want to make sure that we're thinking about that and that we are also thinking about um, involving the community throughout the entire process because I think, you know, the sense that I've gotten, and I'm not a middle school parent, but the sense that I've gotten from a lot of members in the community who are, is that even though it's just a two-year school, quote unquote, People care very deeply about what happens in our middle school, right? And rightfully so. I think it's a great period of transition for students. It's a great period of transition for educators. And so we want to make sure that we are creating a stable system that 
connects the students from the elementary school years to their high school years and beyond. Um, and the only way we do that is by creating strong systems by which you know, we have stable leadership that can continue in that path forward. So. Comment? Um, Mr. Denling. Uh, just, so just a brief question. So my presumption is that after the interim principal is hired that that interim principal would then conduct assistant principal searches. Have you thought through what happens with that, those positions afterwards? Right. So once that principal is hired, then we would sit down and discuss what the leadership structure of the school would look like. So yes, that's a possibility if they choose to have an assistant principal. Thank you. Mr. Dinsmore. Well, um, I'm just, I was curious because um, I know that because the church I go to is also hiring an interim uh, minister, so I just was drawing a parallel. One of the things that we um, were looking at was we were seeing the interim position as a time to use the fact that the current administrator is only going to be there for a couple of years, to use that to make some changes in the way we manage the building. And I'm curious if you also are, um, have any goals in mind of ways you can use the interim, the, the nature of an interim being a short-term thing, changes you'd like to see made to the middle school or like the overall structure, or if there are, I don't know, if, yeah, not necessarily you, just any <laughs> individual. <laughs> so um, I think not specifically, um, like not anything that I think I'm comfortable saying right now, though this is the change I'm looking for, but I do think the lens that you shared I think is true, that having someone come in and be able to view current systems and structures and offer um, feedback to how things are going and perhaps have um, acknowledged things that are going well that we don't even realize are going well because it's the way things, ha it's the way things are done. Uh, that often happens when someone comes in, uh, as well as identify gaps that we may not be aware of. It's the um, expression I often try to use is, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so sometimes someone coming in for an interim can often identify those things that, because kind of buses keep on running and kids, um, teachers group do great with kids, uh, great work with kids every day, we, we sometimes don't see those other things. And, and certainly people in interim roles can uh, sometimes offer slightly less, more unbridled, less unbridled. I get, I get the double negatives are throwing me off. But uh, feedback to how things are going and what uh, what potentially could shift in the future. So I think it's a really valid point, um, but I think that that is one of the benefits of the approach. So we have um, another section of the presentation. Are we comfortable moving forward to it? So this one is, this section is just as brief as the one prior to it. Um, so we formed the search review committee, the search process review committee, and um, our purpose was to review what's happening now in the district and to just look and make recommendations as to what can go better, because there's always room for improvement in any process that you have. Our com uh, committee members, so I sent out an email asking anyone who would like to join to, to let me know. And I received quite a bit of requests to join this committee. So through a lottery system, we were able to um, have people from each of the bargaining units join. So we have clerical, we have secretarial, uh, well, clerical. We have food service, we have paras, we have teachers, we have administrators, we have a representation of every, every group there. And we also have uh, a person from CPAC, which is the Special Ed Parent Advisory Council. We have uh, community members. We have parents and guardians on that committee. And we have been, today I guess would be our midpoint, so we've met three times already. And I'll say that although our work starts at 3.30 and ends at 6, a lot of times, or even last week Thursday, we were still there at 6.30 continuing the work because the conversations and the work um, as we're doing it, it gets so intense, right? and because they're committed to making sure that this process works well and we can have something that's lasting for our district. So, you know, I, I really do want to thank those on that committee for the, the work that they're doing and the time that they have been willing to, to share to, to make sure this goes well. So, so far we created an outline and today 
we've been um, working in small groups, just adding the details to what the outline is and the plan for moving forward. So I kind of gave you guys a sneak peek by saying that the superintendent would be added uh, earlier in the process. But there's so many things that, um, so many remarkable things that the committee members have talked about and would like to see included in the search process that, um, you know, I, I, I just sit back and say, okay, go ahead, write whatever it is that you want Amherst to start doing and you want Amherst to be the leader in as long as it's within the laws and it's ethical, right? And they have been doing that. So here is uh, on the next line a list of the community members and the, the committee members. So you have some community people, you have some teachers, um, two from the middle school, you have um, just many different people. Initially, Paul Wiley was facilitating along with me this week. It's just me facilitating. And the, the meetings are still going very, very well. So any questions about that? We know we have a deadline, and we are working diligently to, to reach there. Can you remind us what the deadline is? Sorry. June 1st. Cool. Mrs. Dennis, thank you. Um, thank you. So I was just wondering if you could share with the committee some of the, I guess, key questions that the search process committee is grappling right now, or even just a, a sample of some of the, the questions that they're asking themselves. It started off with um, some of the questions that were asked here, like when should we let the superintendent come in and does he have the um, basic authority to just end everything, right? And um, some of the things that we looked at is why aren't we as a district attracting more persons of color and retaining them and how are our questions and our actions in line with our missions as a district? our mission and vision as a district. And then what could we do better, right? Always a good question to ask. What could we do better and how can we get there? So I don't wanna say too much because our plan was to always have this written statement so that mm -hmm. no one says too, too much and, sure. and I don't want to sure. violate that. So Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Demling and Ms. Kaczynski. I looked this way, unfortunately. <laughs> if I looked this way, you'd have gone first. <laughs> I'm happy to see. <laughs> um, so, so thank you for taking this on. Obviously, very important work, and, and I think, I think, like uh, to echo your comment uh, a few seconds ago, to have a, um, an attitude of continuous improvement in all of our processes, all the time, is is I think a good, healthy um, approach for an organization to take, particularly when it comes to hiring processes. Um, you know, the the timing of it, given that there has been such intense community opinion. Um, both positive and negative about why certain candidates did or did not go forward with the middle school hiring process, um, I, I, I think um, has created a, a bit, I, I think had the potential to create a bit of um, sort of overlap confusion that like, that something was broken fundamentally in our hiring process. And so I guess if you could just speak to, because you know, um, you've been on the ball since August, uh, if you spoke about uh, in terms of licenses, I, I'm sure you've looked at our hiring practices and and have been managing that as well. Uh, whether you in general see that our hiring process was good, but we should always be continuously improving, or were there issues that like set off alarm bells in your mind that needed immediate fixing? And um, I guess I'm just trying to understand where this came in response to other than the middle school search. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as one who believes in continuous improvement, there. This just um, gave us a way to sit down and say, let's form a committee and improve on whatever it is that we're doing. So I wouldn't say that the previous process was broken, per se, but there were places where we could do better. And um, I'll say the timing, as you mentioned, of this committee and the work that we, we're going to have to do in hiring the um, interim is important because typically a search takes a month at most, right? And to have this search process committee come up with this plan in three weeks and then see how the plan works <laughs> right, is important because then we have an opportunity then again to tweak anything that needs to be tweaked in the, for the summertime because we're still continually hiring. Um, when I look at what was done in the middle school search, There, I, I, I don't see where anything went wrong. There are people who may disagree with that, 
and there are tons of people who would agree with that. And so um, just to have someone else look into what was done, we did create this committee. Thank you. Ms. Kosensky? Um, so my, my first is just to thank everybody on that committee because I know um, they were given a very large task with a very short time frame mm -hmm. to people that are already very busy at the end of the school year. So I, I just really appreciate all their time and right. effort to, to take this very seriously and try to really make it work in the timeline that we have. So I just I would like to thank everybody for doing that. Um, and then I guess my, my second comment is, and I, I think you just answered it, was what are we doing going forward? So this is step one, it sounds like. We're going to make some changes. We're going to try it. We're going to see and have sort of a report out. And um, if time allows, um, in the next several meetings, you know, after this, and so you have time to sort of boil it down mm -hmm. and say, okay, we made some changes. I'd love to hear the pluses and minuses from that, right. um, you know, in a few months' time when we've had a little trial run on it and, and kind of where we're going to tweak it from there. Mm -hmm. And the plan with this committee is to make sure that whatever we come up with will last, whether I'm in this seat or Dr. Morris is in that seat. It's just something that, you know, anyone can come in and say, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And it's a process that works and is correct and is representative of all voices and includes all, you know, all people into the, the you know, the candidacy and into the interviewing, right? So. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the trial run. Uh, we've already started by even the job description going out, and today I was challenged um, by the committee to now go to a process that we're uh, an interview that's going to take place very shortly and see if we can you know throw some of our ideas into that process and you know get a a, a quick uh, what is it, micro view of whether it's working for that mm -hmm. so that while we're still sitting as a committee we can make some tweaks. And also, I like this group so much that I'm going to try to convince them that after we do this process, <laughs> that we meet as a committee to see how we can retain people of color in the district. So, thank you. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Because I mean, one of one of my comments is going to be that. So we've learned a lot this evening, and I think it's been ext I think it's been extremely helpful, and I hope the I hope the public, both people who are here, people who are watching, and hopefully people who watch later on Amherst Media. Um, have a chance to really absorb a lot of this information and think about it. Um, as you mentioned earlier, people, you'll, you accept questions. If you get mm -hmm. questions um, over email that you can respond to. But I think in general, a couple of things I've learned is one around, again, sort of the deliberate ongoing process around licensure, professional development, and the overall quality of, of the hiring. But also just your your unspoken, I guess, or ex implicit in what you were saying was your view of your professional responsibility to um, both hiring but also all the staff in terms of how you're helping them develop as well as understand and adhere to best practices as well as obviously the law, which I think is fantastic. Um, we learned obviously about the search process literally that's going on now for an interim. But then um, uh, to me there are echoes in the search process committee to some of the discussions that happened over the last year around how um, uh, you and the superintendent both went out to different schools and have gone through multiple processes of engaging, getting information, learning, creating sort of small group, almost like workshop settings with um, that include oftentimes staff, um, members of the community, parents, um, sometimes students, and um, sure, often students, and, uh, and use that as, an, as a method of, so we talked about continuous improvement, but one of the questions that's often implicit that we have around the table is, well, who's doing the continuous improving, right? I mean, if you, a person could go in the, I always used to say in uh, work I used to do, that if you think that, that really good public processes or work is you sitting at your desk thinking great thoughts, then you don't understand it, right? It's like it, there's, the process is always around how you're engaging and doing sort of mutual feedback loops of learning, creativity, and accountability. And um, that's what you're describing. So hearing that you're actually going to continue it and apply it to other subjects uh, sounds neat, but also I'm calling it out because we don't often call out the fact that um, this is good practice. And it's one that also speaks to the values of our district and the values of, of many people who come here um, in all different walks of life to um, learn about how we're making decisions or developing policies as a district. 
So are there other questions or comments? Otherwise, we can close this section. We are closing this section. Oh, sorry, Superintendent. I was wondering if I could ask for a brief recess. Um, just some well, I'm only after I close the section, man. I thought you just said I, the I was about to. Then you raised your hand. All right, I'm closing that section. You have something to say, Mr. Superintendent? No, I was wondering if just some, some staff have been here since early in the morning yes. to through. If we could take a brief recess and, and then come back. Uh, with your future. assent? Committee assents, yes. All right, thank you. Fox in the cartoon is yeah, looking for you to. It's not for you to ask. Yeah, but somebody only hour. estimated an hour to get us to 9.30. Who, who, who does these estimates? We're talking about continuous improvement. Collects some data. So we are approximately um, two hours behind, an hour and a half behind. Actually, no, we'll be, we'll be an hour. We're an hour behind. So, yeah. Yeah. So he had a yes. We may shift. I uh, wonder if they're discussing shifting. Um, because we have staff members that have particular votes, right? Do uh, you know? I wonder if we're going to hold those off a little bit. Yeah, it was. It's, yeah, Sean and. Oh, um, I didn't check the calendar. But I was talking to Susan Schilling. There was and one of the votes. It was already in an email. Are you taking a. And I didn't notice it. it was at the bottom of one of that very long. Um, um, I'd like to get the next one over. So the first one is. As would um, I. I'm just wondering if the two staff members would like to get there. So I think it's just like double. This one should be quick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I'm like. I think it'll be quick. I agree. I agree. <laughs> well, I. I know yeah. I, I and I agree and with right you now, about by the way, Audra, I agree with you about being humane. <laughs> like I agree with you about being humane to the staff over here. We need to get people here. Uh, yeah, I always have snacks in the bag for these meetings. <laughs> 
I just realized the break could go on forever, so that's why I was gaveling really emphatically. Uh, and it worked! Look at that. People are back. Uh, okay, so we're back in session. The, the next item on our agenda uh, was an open meeting law complaint, um, uh, which was received um, last week. Um, the uh, Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee um, held on Friday uh, an executive session uh, meeting and um, that we received a complaint um, from Christine Ryan um, in which claimed that um, the purpose under which we did which is item three uh, of the purposes under Mass General Law for uh, an executive session which was litigation strategy uh, was not an appropriate um, uh, reason to meet uh, and uh, we had uh, consulted with our council in advance of the meeting uh, essentially the, the purpose was to meet regarding um, uh, Department of Education Office of Civil Rights um, complaint that had been um, filed uh, by a member of the public with uh, DESE and um, we were meeting under the purpose, which is essentially called liability mitigation. Um, and uh, the uh, our attorney, uh, since the, the complainant had uh, proffered that they had discussed um, with uh, the attorney general's office an opinion around whether it was, it was legal to meet for that purpose, um, and they had conveyed that, that per the complainant had conveyed that opinion to us in advance of the meeting. Uh, and of course, in advance of the meeting, we hadn't violated anything, right? Because you haven't meet, met yet. We then went to our attorney, um, forwarded that information, and the attorney went to the attorney general's office and um, spoke uh, on the record with someone there who uh, conveyed to us that, in fact, in their opinion, uh, the meeting was, in fact, lawful under uh, the purposes of executive session for mass general law precisely for the purposes of liability mitigation um, related to um, a, a threatened or actual complaint, in this case an actual complaint. Um, so since we have received a, a open meeting law complaint, um, the, the follow-up for this would be for the committee to draft a letter of response to the complaint. Um, and it would be my recommendation to this committee that the response to that complaint include what I just said to you, only as well documented as can be. Any open to discussion, obviously, on the topic, if there is any, Mr. Demley? Um, do you want to discuss and then entertain a motion, or do you want, or would you rather the reverse? I guess I'll entertain a motion. I found that one. Uh, I move that the school committee authorize the chair with the assistance of counsel to respond to the open meeting law complaint denying the complaint for the reasons described in the May 22nd, 2018 letter uh, provided by counsel. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of this motion as presented um, signify aye by raising your hand. It carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Yes. May I ask Mr. Dimling if he has that in writing? Mr. Demling, could you provide that in writing? Yes. His answer is yes. Yeah, I was unable to keep that. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we have uh, the, the most immediate items are actually votes. And um, aren't you just a spectacular human being for still being here? Mm -hmm. A true public servant. <clears throat> Mr. Mangana, this is called transportation vote, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so last, the last school committee meeting, we talked about the need to vote on an extension to the current transportation contract and review the, the figures. Um, so tonight, I think the wording of the vote is in the packet. It's two separate votes, one to extend the contract with Five Star, um, which does the Emerson Pelham routes, and one to extend the contract with Kosmeskis that does the Shrewsbury and Leverett routes. Um, I'm happy to answer any additional questions you may have thought of between last meeting and tonight. Okay, entertain a motion. Somebody would like to make a motion. I'll move to extend the existing contracts with Five Star Transportation, Inc. by one additional year, FY19, in accordance with the provisions of the existing contracts. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? And Mr. Sullivan. 
I have a question. Um, which one of our bus services provides the Smith Votec routes? That would be Five Star. Any further questions? Sorry, <laughs> Sullivan, sure. <laughs> So I have a complaint from the students in Shutesbury about the van service to Smith from Shutesbury. Um, there were six occasions this year, including yesterday, where the van doesn't show up. Hmm. And sometimes the bus company is notified, and sometimes the bus company is not notified that the van will not be coming up the hill. And so that means that those students cannot attend school because they can't get a ride. Huh. And the response from Smith is, tell the superintendent. So, Dr. Morris? That one? There's an issue. This one over here? Yes, that, that one over there. And I appreciate it, and I'll work to get a response to you. And I'll just point out that the van piece isn't five-star, so that would be a, something we'll look into internally. Okay. Because the, the, yeah, the bus Only part, the bus is, the bus star, part is, yeah. is good. It's getting down to the bus. Okay. Thank you. That's important. Uh, anything further? Uh, seeing no further comments or questions, uh, the motion uh, to extend existing contract with Fast Transportation by one additional year of 2019 in accord with the provision of the existing contract. All those in favor signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously. Uh, anyone have anything to say on motion number two who I can recognize? Mr. Donius. Um, move to extend the existing contract with FM Cosmescus. Incorporated by one additional year, FY19, in accordance with the provisions of the existing contract. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all those, in favor, <laughs> all those in favor of the motion as, as uh, read, uh, please signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. And Thank I guess you. I'd repeat something Mr. Mangano said at the beginning for the purposes of people watching at home or in the audience. We talked about this quite a bit last meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is something we've been discussed. We've discussed thoroughly. Uh, Thank you. Moving forward, we now have <coughs> Summit Academy move vote. Uh, would you like to introduce this item, or are we, Principal Slovin, going to do so? Or? I, I can introduce it. And um, so this has been something that was speaking of sure. having uh, a topic that's been discussed um, significantly throughout the this, but particularly the budget cycle has been the move, and the language is pretty specific in the motion, um, to really co relocate Summit Academy students from the current location to a separate school located at the regional high school. And I just want to emphasize, I know we've talked about it here, but for the public, that this is not joining two schools and there's no separation. This is actually a physical move of Summit Academy to be an independent day school located within the walls of the high school, so to speak, although we're building walls around that. So there, there's some permeability, but that it, it retains its independent day school status. Uh, by independent, I don't mean private school. I mean independent of the high school. Um, and so Mr. Slovin and Dr. Brady are here if there's questions, um, but it was more just if there are you know, uh, things that okay. the committee well, we could have. we could entertain a motion and then move from there. Great. Is there a motion to be made? I'll, I'll move good. to affirm the decision by the district administration as part of the FY19 budget process to relocate Summit Academy students from the current location at 1001 Southeast Street, Amherst, to a separate school located within the Amherst Regional High School campus at 21 Mattoon Street, Amherst. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussions or questions which is noted? It'd also be directed to Principal Slevin. Just as uh, I apologize, I missed the last meeting, which I think this was a topic, but just I would love to hear an update about how things are going and the student transition and what we're expecting for September. Um, you know, we're, we're in the heart of the end of school, so we're, we're thinking about graduation. Um, we started having conversations with um, with with the students during a community meeting, um, I think kids are uh, oh, excited and also ready for summer. And so, uh, but we have we have a summer services, mm -hmm. and we had talked about this once before here that we're we're trying to figure out whether we're going to do part of it at the high school. Can't do it right there, and I think the kids would like to do that. Um, you know, I I, I think. Uh, we're in the heart of it, right? It's it's a lot to happen in a short amount of time, and so we want to prepare the kids as best we can. And um, 
you know, we started working with the transition team over at the high school. We met, actually met today with Dr. Brady and others. I think that's going well. So we're just trying to think about what could come up and how we can kind of proactively think about those and get some frequently asked questions, papers out there about processes that are just going to come up. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, I'm excited. I, I, you know, we've gone by, we've checked out the spaces. It, it's, it, the opportunity still remains. I mean, it's really going to be uh, kind of a, you know, a, as we go kind of transition, you know. And, um, you know, I, I wish the kids were here. So I, I think we still, we're still in that place, you know. We're still kind of, and we'll, I, I think the staff's ready to make the move. Um, I think kids are, are, some are right ready to do it and some are still kind of holding on to the space. So that's, I think, where we're at. Okay. Yeah. Superintendent? Just, just to add on the facility side, um, that our facilities team has already done, anytime you're, and I'm the last person to describe this well, but I'll do my best. Um, anytime you're, you're changing walls, changing structures, you do a lot of environmental testing on the front end to see the methodology that needs to be used to do that, this is at the on the high school campus where um, Summit Academy will be located. That's already happened, and we already have a good plan of action in addition to the architectural piece, but um, just a timeline of when things need to be happened, if there's any abatement that needs. All that's been worked out in the last three weeks uh, by Mr. McPherson and the facilities team so that when students leave the high school, their team can get in right away and make sure that the, the timeline still works to have the building ready ready to go for students come fall. Um, about the, we did, um, through your help from everybody, we did get kind of the space we wanted. So we are putting up walls, and the clinicians are making sure we got space. And we and, and Mr. McPherson really helped us kind of design a space that I'm, I think is really going to be helpful to the students. So uh, I'm pleased with that. Yeah, I think others are as well. Sorry, Ms. Minnie. A trivial but burning question all faculty members have. Are there adequate parking spaces for faculty and staff? <laughs> um, that's a great question because we just <laughs> talked about it today. So there are 34 <laughs> spaces. I kid you not. Um, yeah, no, we're trying to figure out the west side parking lot and how to do that. And Erica Auschler, one of the uh, assistant principals at the high school, just presented that to us today. So that's very much on our minds. It's, it's a good question. Is there, is there a chance for us to, at some, what, what, is there a chance, and if so, when would be the appropriate time for us to, school committee to take a tour take of it sometime? Tour. Do it right now, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Mr. McPherson would be the best person to do it, but I think there is a, a place, and we, we, with our maps, we could go and take a walk, and I could show you yeah. guys what we're thinking. I think once the school ends, they're going to start, so it's kind of like, you know, hard hat time we could do it during the summer what we're going to do oh that this is something we've decided we're going to have updates mm -hmm. through the summer for families so i'm going to take some pictures we're going to do some kind of hey this is where we're at we're going to do one event um in august with families to kind of hang out and do maybe a barbecue on the side which you know you know i guess it's families right now but um we're trying to keep uh, that kind of close kind of connection to the whole project throughout the summer. Yeah, I mean, so having you guys visit would be a great picture. Well, I was going to say, I'll speak for myself, but I, I would love the opportunity to tour at whatever point you guys say is appropriate. And what we can do is we can, I don't know, like put the hard rules down that we don't talk or debate or discuss anything. <laughs> right, and right, so right. we can just show up and like do a tour. You can do all the talking and then we'll just, we'll walk away with smiles on our faces. <laughs> that, I, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that'd be great. You yeah, guys so good with I'd this? Be, yeah. yeah. Let's find a time to do that. I own a hard hat. I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sullivan. I've just got a question that's sure. been kind of tumbling around yeah. since the first time we talked about this. Is there any way that the students could get hold of paintbrushes or something for one day just to go in there and, you know, make their mark on it or do something that said, yeah. you know, so that they can take ownership of that before they actually start in the fall? So, so uh, part of the plans, I don't know if we had said it here, but um, we have a mural that we were working on for Summit just because of the chain. So they've been working on that at Summit. But we just got a great, uh, about, it was a gift from leaders of paint, and it's all paint for murals. Now, I don't know if you guys yeah. heard about that, but it was probably presented to you guys about $7,000 worth of paint. And we have, and we organized it. And 
that's going to be part of the first kind of thing is to start a mural. And the, uh, a lot of kids are invested in that. So, so we are doing something like that. Right now, one of the big projects is trying to figure out how to get our um, greenhouse over. And so that might happen during the summer, too, where kids are going to be taking it down. And then we'll readjust it over there. But it's but we want to do that, and the kids do want that. So I appreciate you being, you know, asking about it. So they do want to get in there and do that. That's great. Uh, any other comments, Kristen, before we move proceed with the vote? Um, and I think we did hear that we'd love an invitation, and maybe if there's if there's newsletters that you're sending out that you want to think of worth sharing with the that. committee, share them with the committee so we can get updated. Um, so we have the motion. Um, Oh, you have one more question. Chair? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, Mr. Dillman. I just wanted to offer a brief comment that you offered on a previous item, that this is for those who are watching uh, at home and they've yeah. seen this for the first time. Uh, we've talked about this topic a lot. Oh, goodness, um, yes. <laughs> through, there's been a lot of, lot of presentations. and um, I don't mean that badly. Yeah. I just mean goodness, yes. yes. We've yes. talked we, about this quite a bit. There's been thorough, sensitive yeah. deliberation. And, yeah, and also a lot of um, a really keen interest in how it's going mm -hmm. and, and how it's going to continue to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Dillman. So we have the motion. Um, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll definitely send out an invitation. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, artifacts for superintendent evaluation. So I would just clarify what is going around is a pretty thick document, and the goal is not to go through the document tonight. It's an orientation to the document. Okay. Uh, and I finished it at noon today, and oh. thought it would be unfair to send it out at noon because invariably some people would find their time to read it, and someone. So I just the goal is not that this is, you know, I just want to be super clear on that point. You were worried you were going to get questions on page twelve. And you're <laughs> right. Like, no, that's not fair. <laughs> yes. Everyone yes. gets to read it first. Um, okay. Or that people would feel like, oh my God, they got it, and there wasn't an orientation on the front end, and what the heck is this 18-page document mean? Um, okay. So um, for those of you who were on the committee last year, this is the same format because the feedback was that it was helpful, perhaps because I had more of a full year in the role. It's a longer document, so I don't know if my apologies are needed or <laughs> apologies are needed for that. But um, I just want to take probably four or five minutes to describe an orientation. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, the second, the first page is just an introduction. The second page uh, describes the goals, and uh, as has been discussed in the, all three committees, I created one document for all three so that there wasn't multiple for Pella members like Ron. It wouldn't be two documents that you were, you were searching through. So the second page has the agreed upon goals that were voted by each committee. Um, and you can see that about halfway down, you'll see Amherst and Pelham only, region only, because um, some of the goals were, were across all three districts and some were not. Um, and it has the standards and indicators after each. The third page then breaks down those standards and indicators a bit more. Um, so what was agreed to in terms of the process is that I'd be providing artifacts only on the indicators and elements that were connected to the approved goals. So that's what's in this. It's not all 47 of the elements. It's the ones that were connected to the goals. And then uh, from page 4 to page 18 are the actual artifacts. And this will be emailed to you in the morning because it's actually a pretty lame standalone document because it has all these hyperlinks that you can't access in this format. Um, but the, much like last year, it tries to describe more generally the work of the district and my work across these dimensions. So for instance, in the first one, diverse learners' needs, you'll see like the preschool model at Crocker Farm, that's an Amherst-specific item. So you do have to sort of read through it, and if you're not an Amherst school committee member, you get to disregard that, which is perhaps the nice part. There's a significant number um, that are universal, that are by universal, I mean all three districts, you know, like the, the bottom of page four where we talk about sheltered English immersion course uh, was all three districts and actually has particular relevance to Pelham. Um, for reasons I won't get into because that'll get into the content. Um, and a couple times, like on page five, or if you look at page five, just as an example, so there's hyperlinks, so where, I'm just picking one maybe towards the bottom, a higher percentage of staff of color joined our district than in previous years. If you're, if you're, what happens is if you click on that link and the links are in blue, the data source comes up. So you'll end up with a lot of tabs on your computer when you're going through it, but it's a way that didn't have like, 150 pages of things to literally tab uh, after it and seemed like it worked well for the committee last year. Also on page five, 
uh, towards the bottom, there were, I think this may be the only place where the, the two elements were so tightly connected that I combined them to put the artifacts for both because it, it felt a little, one was, for, you know, one was for Amerson Pelham, one was for Amerson Region, and I had them separated and it just, it felt like it would be really confusing, so I did combine them and hopefully that's not confusing to anyone here. Um, the only other thing I'll share before opening up to questions is the very last page on the back of page 18. I included an artifact that wasn't directly connected or explicitly connected to any of the specific goals. Um, and that there was a conversation, or electronic conversation with, between um, some people from last year about this. And no one asked me to do it, but I really liked the feedback I received from the superintendent, superintendent evaluation survey that was done last year. Now last year was a little more tightly connected to goals, but I found it useful, even though this one wasn't, to offer the same one so I could see how people felt a year later. Mm -hmm. Um, so no one asked me to do it, I just did it, and I'm including a goal, not because it's perfect or there's no signs of like anyone saying I need improvement, that's not the case, but I think it's actually an, a, a nice reflection of the senior leadership team and their view and mm -hmm. something that's helpful for me on my leadership as, as I continue to improve in the work. And so I thought it'd be relevant um, because part of this process, and this is what I'll end with, um, isn't just to share, oh, the wonderful things we did. I think. I'm very proud of the district when I look at these 18 pages, uh, but it's actually to set the goals for next year. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was important to include because I think it sets a, a nice view, for me it set a nice vantage point to think about next year and what are the internal folks who interact with me on a routine basis feeling like it's working really well and what do we need to focus more of our t time and energy on. So it's not directly connected to a specific goal or element. You certainly could make those connections, but I thought it was a valuable uh, artifact to include in the document, um, not because anyone sort of asked me. Well, Audrey did, but it was it was after it was done. So yeah. um, I think you're kind of begging for us to ask you next year, right? Yes. Uh, you're like, well, could you please ask me? Because then I can say. I'm going to do it anyway. Your request. It's, it's 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 a valuable it's a valuable source, but uh, I just wanted to delineate that as yeah. being separate from the other artifacts, particularly for folks who haven't looked at something like this before. Do you have anything? Questions? Absolutely. I thought you were asking a question. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask a question actually following up on this because it, it is connected to a question or a discussion that we had had previously about continuity. Mm -hmm. um, and so you raised the point that last year's survey was sort of a great tool to help you identify things to work on the following year. Um, what were those things that you were working on this year that we should be looking out for? Yeah, I think... Um, Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. Um, Sorry, I'm one, no, 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 <laughs> no. It's it's really value. It's a great question, um, and I don't mean that like in the like silly way that people say it's a great question. It's a, it, it's a great question because it's relevant, <laughs> not just because it like makes me think. Um, All so, the other times he says it's a good <laughs> question, though, we're now on notice. Actually, yeah. <laughs> almost never say that. It's like an old teacher thing. Sorry to go like tangential, but like the one time you say that, the next person who asks a question who. I just say, well, the answer is, right? And then that's like, well, I guess my question wasn't right. So, so it's really, it's not a good term to use from an educational point of view. That being said, um, so I think the difference, what I saw last year in the results was an appreciation given the context of the year, uh, particularly the, um, how the year flowed, um, was much more um, short term in terms of like this worked well um, but the way I interpreted the data, and I don't have it in front of me to say, was like a little more yearning for long-term sustainable practices to be in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like the biggest takeaway that I remember from the survey data was sort of a lot of the short-term keep things running smoothly, make some you know, short-term improvements, that stuff landed more positively. And I think some of the m expressions that I took quite seriously is, Great that short-term stuff is there. We now need to move forward, not just for next year, but thinking ahead and not knowing what my role was going to be, if you remember the timing of it. We still needed to do, it's kind of re relevant to the conversation earlier, we need to do set the stage for kind of continued future work, not just year by year, but um, kind of having more longevity and more forward thinking to it. Other um, questions, Mr. Delman? This is not a great question. But <laughs> um, so this is really... Educational, I mean, even from a school committee perspective, there are things in here that, you know, I've not, you know, paid that close attention to. So it's really helpful. Is, is this public or will it be public? Or, because mm -hmm. I think just in terms of, you know, like you said, um, 
And I think this is consistent with the theme of, of last year's, if I, really, if I recall the impression correctly, that it's, it's not just a, hey, look at all the awesome things I did. It's, you know, it goes into a lot of depth and detail about things that a lot of people worked on. So I think it would be a pretty educational document for the community. Yeah, we can figure out a way to put that on the website. And at, at whatever point in this process you're comfortable. Yeah, yeah, maybe a little later. Uh, if I can think through that with the, perhaps the regional chair, because yeah, I'm conscious there's, this is going to three committees, and I don't want to make decisions. Then you can later work it out with the other chairs. I can also <laughs> go to the when you're in their meeting, you can really, yeah, really <laughs> be a surreal thing. Sorry, I guess it's what, getting loopy or something. Uh, no, that sounds great. Um, and so my we the instrument that we have for evaluation is that um, online or online soon or um, I have it ready anytime we're ready for it to go live okay I have yes. a comment on that so um, I think when our timeline we're on a relatively short uh, timeline so mm -hmm. I think that um, my, uh, when we talked about this at the subcommittee was like a two-week window seemed to be about the right amount of time to fill out the online uh, evaluation mm -hmm. um, much more than that and it's going to fall to the bottom of somebody's to-do list and not get done um, and then that would make a little bit of time for the chair and perhaps the vice chair to mm -hmm. put together the summative report um, and then my other comment was for those that are new to this, um, DESI has the rubric, which you should definitely have printed out and available in terms of what all of the ratings, one through five, mean for the, each of these elements. They sort of give a nice um, real world, uh, I won't say example, but expectation for each of those ratings. So, Was there a PDF of that last year we got? There is, and we can send it around again. Why don't we do that yeah. again? Because I remember we did that last time to make it even easier for people to print it out or put it on their yeah. electronic device of their choice. Yeah. Superintendent? As a matter of just being efficient, we can include that in Ms. Westmoreland's email about the process so everything's in one place. That'd be great. Um, That'd be yeah. great. And yeah. so we're we planning on sending this out like tomorrow? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Thank, Thank you, you, Debbie. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, anything else in this topic? And this isn't a vote item, Ms. Bazanis. So just uh, to finish up on that thread, because I appreciate Audra's timeline mentality. <laughs> I'm looking at my calendar right now, which is why I have my phone open. Um, so we're looking at uh, May 23rd, and then two weeks out from that would be June 6th. Does that sound right for responding or returning? Yeah, when's our June oh. meetings? Because we need to vote at it vote on the results, I think, in one of the June meetings in order to meet our requirements. I believe the current schedule is the 12th and the 26th for the June meetings for Region. Okay. So 6th does sound fine. Yeah. That sounds good. Yes. It, it's not my decision, but just because I work I'm in this awkward place of just knowing <laughs> multiple things about other districts. Yeah. I do think because the my understanding is the Amherst and Pelham school committees are planning to have their meeting on this topic the week of the 18th, and there's an extra week for region. I'm just conscious that some of you will be filling it out too. So if it was due something like the 12th, that would still give the chair and vice chair two weeks to organize it and would give members who are filling out multiple instruments a little more time instead of having everything do at once. I don't know if it was better or worse, but I just mm. wanted to play out that timeline and then you can decide what you would like to do. Why don't you say the end of the week of the 8th? Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Like Friday, 5 o'clock, Friday, or midnight. Midnight, better <laughs> yet. For all you people who are going to do The deadline will be in the memo. Yeah, yes. the deadline will be in the memo. So midnight, <laughs> June 8th. One other, um, last year, Debbie, when we submitted it, we sent an email to Debbie, and she was able to make us a PDF right. that she could send back to us. And yeah, I we should still recommend do, we, that process. We should well. do that. I think we should, um, we should do all the practices we had last year. <laughs> I mean, we all liked it. When it was done, we all said, "Hey, that worked really well." We were even kind of surprised ourselves, like it was the first time we had the process. <laughs> so I would, I would just endorse us whatever we did last year. Like if there's something in an email or whatever, let's make sure we do it again. Yeah. Do you want to volunteer to like look over what Debbie's doing to make sure it looks right to you? Sure. And I don't mean she's not going to be wonderful. I just mean since you seem to have a good eye on this right now. I might remember another little tidbit. Exactly. I... That would be awesome. <laughs> Is that all right? 
You are hereby deputized. For that. <laughs> um, anything else on this subject? Seriously, I mean, because this is, you'll be next thing you know, you'll have a live link and you'll be working through. Yeah. So just to continue in the timeline thing. <laughs> yeah, sure, exactly. There you go. I'm sorry, I'm so focused no, this on is this. Good. Um, so the deadline for all committee members to submit their evaluations uh, is midnight, June 8th. And then for the chair um, and or chairs, I guess, would be the following week, the 15th or so, to have everything, the summative prepared. Sounds fine to me. I just want to say it out loud so that we know what we're working No, I'm glad you are. Yeah. I'm glad you are. <laughs> And, and you know the, the neat thing is you happen to be a chair of a different committee, mm -hmm. so you can like Which when you when you're there. You can actually <laughs> make sure I don't drop the ball, you know. So we're done. I was it was going to be on the topic, but a non sequitur to that last piece. Is. That'd be more fun, though. Are you all are we all set with the fifteenth as being a deadline? I mean, I'm serious. I want to get the work done. I'm not trying yeah. to be yeah. totally loopy. Yes. So, the, so the one thing I, I wanted to share at the beginning that I neglected too is that if there are individual questions. Um, I'm thinking of Mr. Demling's comment of like, there's some things in here that school can member, there may have been a, not have been a topic that people should, in my opinion, feel free to be in touch with me individually okay. to say, tell me more about that. Or, you know, and that I thought was a helpful process last year. And it really mimics the way um, our best practice um, that we use for teachers and principals is that they share artifacts and it actually, um, if, if there's not clarity, can lead to a discussion that can be very generative. So. I just want to, from my vantage point, I don't want to speak for any committee members, certainly the chair, but I'd be very open if people have questions to, for people to be in touch with me directly. Um, and I didn't want to, for people who haven't been through this before, I didn't want people to not know Speaking that that option was Speaking for one of the chairs anyways, I think that's awesome. Yeah. I think people should do that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Um, Student representative transition discussion. Shinnesmore, are you leading this discussion? Um, You're leaning in like you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not leading oh, this superintendent? Not really we sure. So, <laughs> actually, I think I'd like to start. It's the very last page in the packet from tonight, which is the Mass General Law about Student Advisory Committee and um, and student representatives. Um, because I, I don't think it's been a practice that has always been, I thought it'd be good to start from a place of what the, the law says we should do. So I'm actually, if it's brief enough, may I read this aloud? Just because sure. I think it's germane to, and we have one community member still here, but just for the, if anyone is watching. So it's Mass General Law, Chapter 71, Section 38M, Student Advisory Councils. And committees. Student Advisory Committees, thank you. Uh, Weird font, right? Um, and thank you, Ms. Ms. Moreland, for identifying this. Um, and it describes that school committees of cities, towns, and regional school districts shall meet at least once every other month during the month's schools in session with a student advisory committee to consist of five members to be composed of students elected by the student body of the high school or high schools in each city, town, or regional school district. The members of such student advisory committees shall be shall by majority vote prior to the first day of June of each year. Elect from the number, uh, oh yeah, I can't read this. Elect from their number a chairperson who shall serve for a term of one year. Said chairperson shall, shall be an ex officio non voting member of the school committee without the right to attend executive sessions unless such right is expressly granted by the individual school committee. Said chairperson shall be subject to all school committee rules and regulations and shall serve without compensation. Sorry, Jack. Um, <laughs> so um, wow. that is the law uh, and um, I just thought it was worth having that as the frame for the discussion instead of what has or hasn't happened in the past just being forward thinking okay so being forward thinking um, this begins with an election by the student body in this case of the regional school district of five members of a student advisory committee, right? Mm -hmm. At the high school, high school students, specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then out of their out of their number, they have to then choose a uh, ex officio a chairperson who shall then be an ex officio non voting member of the school committee. Okay. So on a forward looking. Oh, sorry, Mr. Densmore. Oh. 
I mean, you can finish what you were going to say. I was just going to talk about how this has worked in the past. I would love. To, I would, well, we we were prescribed from the superintendent to talk about what's happened in the past. <laughs> but if you but if, but if you'd like to, feel free to. Uh, I was going to direct us towards. All right, this is cool. So what's going to happen now, or what are we doing now? But please. Well, I mean, I just wanted to point out we did have this committee a uh, few years ago, and it worked almost exactly like this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. So yeah. I, and so and uh, Ms. Haygood remembers that, and I and that is how she and I have been uh, setting up the advisory committee for this year. Hmm. Great. Um, but the only the only difference, which I was surprised by in this, is that it says that I have to be uh, elected as the chair in June. And the way we set up elections at the high school is we have elections in September, mm. um, which means <clears throat> well, it's very it's kind of awkward because um, the the this five person committee is selected in June, which means that the if we were to have the I mean sorry the five person committee is selected in September. Which means that if the representative, the student representative to the school committee is selected in June, they might not actually be elected to that committee. You know, yeah. they're kind of a holdover from last year. Yeah. Um, so usually we actually had them be elected in September, yeah. and which is technically illegal, I suppose. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what we should do about that. It seems to me like a good idea to have it be elected at the beginning of the year instead of at the yeah. end. But mm -hmm. well, is it, couldn't mm -hmm. we say September is prior to the first day of June of the following year? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Um, so that was going to be my, my point. So it says prior to the first day of June in each, in each year. So it doesn't say school year or calendar year. And I, don't, I don't think the steel boots are going to come down and stomp all over Mr. Dinsmore's common sense idea. <laughs> right? Well, I, I would feel on pretty safe ground on that. If that's what uh, well, I mean, honestly, this is one of those things that we should just... Um, look into, right? I mean, if our current practice of doing... Yes, Mrs. Jenner? Well, I was going to suggest, and I, I haven't actually looked to see if we have a policy that kind of overlays this one or not, but I'm wondering if it'd be possible for us, for our policy subcommittee, to take a look at <clears throat> our policy, if it exists, and if none does exist, maybe we consider creating one, uh -huh. that sort of lays... Uh, makes a fine point of this one sentence. It sort of clarifies for the committee, the school committee, and the student advisory committee eventually, you know, what the actual practice should be for our district, right? Because I agree, I think that this line could be interpreted to say that, you know, prior to the first day of June uh, in each year, September definitely counts, right? So, you know, I hope so, right? Um, but if we could get some clarity on that, and the policy subcommittee can, you know, can sort of make a determination, <clears throat> maybe we can actually create a policy here for our district mm -hmm. that reflects our thinking and our practice moving forward, and then we have some clarity. I think that's a great idea. I, I just think, as a practical matter, it'd be nice to find out if, um, I'm going to say this bluntly rather than in, uh, any other way, whether anyone care, like, is there anyone out there who has authority who cares whether we use an interpretation in which you're right, the plain English language seems perfectly fine, but my guess is if anyone actually cares if we adopt that usage as a district, um, we can find that out pretty readily, right? Yeah. And I guess that's sort of what I'm suggesting is that maybe the policies, we can sort of kicking it down yeah, 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 yeah. the road so the policy <laughs> subcommittee can find out for us. I think that's <laughs> awesome. Actually, you know, it's not only awesome, it's necessary. Yeah. This is, in fact, if we follow our own rules, this is exactly what we'd be doing. Look at that. Just, Plan comes together. I know, exactly. <laughs> to follow the law, we will ensure we follow our own rules. <laughs> Can that a, be our motto? It's a fine and noble end to a good evening. Um, okay, so is there anything else about any of this us to learn, Jeff, about this? Um, I, I guess I could mention we, we actually have a five-person committee this year, it's formed already. And we're going to have our first meeting next Tuesday, next Thursday, two days from now. Okay. Fantastic. I'm going to be there, right? Yes, you are. Okay. That's what I thought. thought I'd yeah. agree to that. We, uh, actually, we had one earlier this month, too, but only two of the members were there. It was a good meeting. And that was with Sue Denley, though, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. Just <laughs> so more information than the rest of the committee needed to know. <laughs> but it's, um, it's all good. Um, wonderful. No, that's terrific. Anything else okay. anyone has on this? Seriously? Seeing nothing else. Um, do we have any gifts? We do. We only have one copy of it because Two. they got it ready so late this afternoon. <laughs> Would you like me to read it? Uh, yeah, you're going to have to. I mean, somebody's going to have to. Cause I will move to accept the gifts as follows. Amherst Pelham PGO for Hanley Family Florence Bank. 
uh, to support the 2018 Robert Hanley Scholarships in the amount of $10,000. Mm -hmm. James Pastrang, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, apologies, to support the AR Amherst Regional Middle School Ultimate Scholarship in the amount of $1,000. An anonymous gift to support the Community Building Awards, too, at $250 each for a total of $500. Uh, Jeffrey Tripp to support the Anson Tripp Memorial Scholarship for $500. And Peter Tripp to support the Anson Tripp Memorial Scholarship for the amount of $500 for a total of $12,500. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion or questions? Mr. Demling. Just oh, what an amazing gratitude we should have for the uh, magnitude of those scholarships it's, it has an incredible impact on individual students. I also, also want to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Pistrang, ultimate legend and uh, assistant coach on our middle school uh, ultimate team who does a ton of work uh, making that sport uh, available to, to so many. He does a, a lot of work in, uh, involved in the um, uh, middle school tournament. It's, it's one of the only ones of its kind in the, in the region. Um, and I, I think he gives the scholarship every year. It's much appreciated. Wonderful. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the gifts as red signify by raising your hand. And they're accepted unanimously. Um, so the last item on our agenda is school committee planning. Upcoming topics. <laughs> it's just I have one for next October. Okay. <laughs> sure. We need to invite our five students to a pizza party to meet them and their families because we did that once three years ago and it was such a wonderful experience to get to meet all the students and their families. You know, you mentioned that last year and we didn't do it. It's terrible. I'm trying again. No, I know. I just believe <laughs> the reason you say that, I'm like, I remember talking about this yeah. a year ago. Is there any, someone else had their hands up over this direction, Mrs. Donis. Um, I just wanted to raise someone else, I can't remember, from the committee had mentioned this before, and I, and I know I've mentioned it previously too, um, the retreat for this year, yeah. uh, just trying to schedule a good time maybe over the summer or even early fall, whatever makes sense to the committee, but I just think it's critically important to have an opportunity for the committee to reflect on what's happened in the past year um, and think about things that we could be doing better um, and try to, you know, implement a process for ourselves um, to do that. So, I think that's great. I mean, people in favor of having a retreat. Mm -hmm. Can we? Can we? Um, maybe it's not too early. Um, we. I don't know how we doodle poll that and just find different weeks in the summer. That makes sense. Yes. Ms. Jones? And um, in addition to that, I just wanted to um, ask if I think last year may have been the first retreat that I participated in since joining the school committee. Um, and it, it was a good retreat, and I, I loved the venue. I think that, you know, the Amherst College venue was, was great. Um, but I'm wondering if it would be, you know, at all useful to consider having um, someone facilitate a conversation, you know, among mm -hmm. the, the committee so that the chair doesn't have to be presiding over it and the superintendent doesn't have to be, but it's really more of an equal kind of, mm -hmm. you know, participation. Um, because I've been in a lot of facilitated conversations before and, you know, retreats that feel that everyone can have a say and is not just sort of in charge of presiding over a meeting. And I know technically it has to be a public meeting, mm -hmm. um, but if, they, if we can have some, a slightly different structure so that we can actually have a more engaged process from all committee members, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there mm -hmm. as, a, as a possibility. Well, I think that's an idea. I think what we should also consider doing, which I didn't assume we were going to do tonight, uh, is develop even an agenda for it, mm -hmm. where we think about topics we want to have covered in which, I mean, I think it works even better if you have a professional facilitator who's like, for structuring the retreat, and we think about different topics we want covered and have an opportunity to, and I think if we do that, if we do that as a committee early enough, then we could probably even work with a facilitator who could then think through what our objectives are. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, mm -hmm. thinking through that way, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we do this in a way in which is, the process is really developmental? We get through the end of the retreat and we actually have sort of an organized set of, you know, le learnings, as I'll call it, that we can then bring out to a more regular, uh, there is a public meeting, but a more regular public meeting mm -hmm. where we have cameras and all that kind of stuff. Um, so a couple of years ago, I think Dorothy Presser was somebody that was brought mm -hmm. in to help be the facilitator. But I think also um, MASC does have sort of a, 
um, an outline of a retreat meeting and some general guidelines that maybe we should bring to the next meetings as a framework to discuss. Okay. Why don't we, why don't we do that? Uh, Dr. Morris, do you have any roll call list of things that we heard the West? Um, I only had two. One was just a reorganization because at that point, the next time this body right. meets, Pelham will have reorganized. So right. there'll be, well, there'll definitely be at least some new member, uh, a new member. If, um, and um, typically that's when this body reorganizes, when all the towns have done that. Uh, and the second was um, earlier tonight, I heard Ms. Cunningham say that perhaps an update on the hiring process committee's work. Also, um, the timing probably works for the next meeting. Makes sense. Um, and did we send out a revi I mean, an updated list of committees to all the members or not? I've sent it, but I don't remember if I resent it. I think we talked about resending. That's it. no. We need to resend it okay. before the advance of the meeting. And if we could do that, even a, well, potentially with other items, Mr. Jones might have said, if we could do that like well before the meeting, not just with the agenda. So I want people to have a chance to think about it and also if they want to ask questions, not just of me, but any of our colleagues about the different committees. So there was one other item for follow-up that was in our um, minutes from our last meeting, and it was referred to the policy first read of JICFC. Yeah, um, I had asked if we could get another a legal opinion on whether immigration status should be listed separately. Um, so just wanted to remind the committee of that. Okay, sounds good. Anything else? Obviously, uh, one yes, more, so one more thing. I'd just like to say thank you to Mr. Scully for hanging out this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you there. I want to thank you for your comment earlier and thank you for hanging out. And if you come back again, I'll make you cookies. <laughs> <laughs> courteous enough, listen to me. I want to do it. Thank you. It's been very interesting. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, I guess on that upbeat note, is there a move to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify raising your hand. Unanimous.